लो हाँ हाथ बताता हूँ आज हो गए किस पे भेजा है ठीक है हाँ ठीक है मैं भिजवा रहा हूँ आज आज उसकी मीटिंग हो ठीक है अच्छा सेक्रेटरी जनरल ऑफ द एसोसिएशन इन इट्स नाइनटी सिक्स ईयर्स ऑफ एग्जिस्टेंस Dr Mithal is a Fulbright scholar having wide ranging experience of more than 3 decades in higher education in policy planning and uh, management of higher education. She was the first vice chancellor of Bhagat Phool Singh Mahila Vidyalay Kanpur the first rural women university of North India in 2008. Dr Pankaj Mithal is a much traveled academic and has been honored by several organizations. she is closer to karnataka as yes, she has been conferred the honorary doctorate honoris causa from karnataka state women's university uh, bijapur i request dr mrs pankaj mithal to deliver the welcome address and present the theme of the conference thank you very much his excellency the honorable vice president of india shri m vaikaya naidu ji who will be joining shortly honorable governor of karnataka shri thavar chand gehlot ji honorable president of aiu dr g thirubasagam ji honorable vice chancellor of university of mysore professor g hemant kumar ji registrar of the university of mysore past presidents of aiu we have with us professor d s johan and professor p v sharma here Uh, distinguished chairpersons and speakers of all the technical sessions representative of apex bodies and international delegates we have dr bhola thapa with us who is from kathmandu university esteemed vice chancellors of various universities both present as well as former who have come here from far off places all over the country faculty members of university of mysore the students who are sitting here ladies and gentlemen i welcome you all to the 96th annual general meet of aiu and national seminar of vice chancellors at the outset i would like to, like to thank the university of mysore for hosting the 96th annual general meet and national seminar of vice chancellors on a very important theme realizing sustainable development goals through higher education institutions we are grateful for the hospitality and excellent arrangements made by the university Mysore also creates nostalgic movement for us because this was the place where 97 years back AIU was formed in 1925 so in Mysore AIU was formed and in fact AIU AIU functioned from the campus of Mysore University from 1932 to 1937 so therefore we are very honored to have our annual general conference in Mysore University I welcome the honorable vice president of India Shri M Venkaiya Naidu ji who is joining through virtual mode to inaugurate this meet Shri Naidu ji as you all know is a very well read person and very passionate about the education in India we are grateful to you sir for having agreed to inaugurate the meet as a chief guest we welcome the honorable governor of Karnataka Shri Thavar Chand Gehlot ji who is amongst us for the inaugural program he is the 19th governor of karnataka and the first from madhya pradesh to serve as the governor of karnataka he has earlier served as the minister of social justice and empowerment in the government of india we welcome you sir for gracing this occasion on behalf of aiu i would like to welcome the vice chancellor of mysore university professor hemant kumar ji and his entire team and also thank him for hosting the event on behalf of association of indian universities 
I welcome Professor G. Thirubasagam, sir. He is the Honorable President of AIU and has been a constant in source of inspiration for all of us. I welcome the past presidents of AIU who are present here. Professor P.B. Sharma is there. Professor D.S. Johan is there. Uh, we welcome the distinguished chairpersons and speakers of all the technical session, heads of the APEX bodies and international delegates who are here from ACU and University of Kathmandu and some would be joining virtually. A hearty welcome to all the vice chancellors who have come here from all over the country to participate in the deliberations. Without this, without all of you, this meet would not have been possible. So we welcome you from the core of our heart. We also welcome Ambassador T.S. Trimurthy, who is the permanent representative of United Nations permanent representative of India to United Nations, who will be delivering the AIU Foundation Day lecture just after the inaugural speech. So thanks, Professor Tirumurthy. A hearty welcome to one and all. As you all know that the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals are to be realized by 2030. We just have eight years left with us to realize these goals. At present, India stands at 120th rank. 120th rank in the SDG report 2021 towards realizing these SDGs. It is therefore important that India takes some serious measures to accelerate the pace of their implementation. Therefore, Association of Indian Universities felt that more than 1,000 universities, more than 45,000 colleges, which are catering to around 38 million students in India, can contribute, can contribute a lot in realizing SDGs and not only SDG 4, which relates to quality education, but all the 17 SDGs by way of conducting research on all the 17 SDGs, by way of sensitizing the students, faculty and the staff and accordingly their parents, by practicing SDGs at their own campuses and also doing impact surveys of various schemes launched by the government for realizing these SDGs. Therefore, we dedicated the complete year 2021-22 to the implementation of SDGs through the higher education institutions. We held five zonal BC meets on different SDGs, where we clubbed four for SDGs and there's a different zonal meets. And in the national conference, we'll be discussing all the 17 SDGs and come out with a report which will be sent to United Nations, Government of India, regulatory bodies and universities giving recommendation on what ought to be done by these agencies for realizing the SDGs at a faster pace. Seeing the importance of the theme of the conference, the United Nations itself has collaborated with AIU for all the five zonal as well as the main conference. The United Nations is the collaborating partner for this particular conference. I'm sure government as well as the universities will find these recommendations very useful. I once again thank the University of Mysore for hosting this conference and welcome you all to AIU National VC Conference of AIU being conducted on a very, very timely and important theme. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for introducing the theme of the conference. Colonel Dr. G. Tiruvazagam is the Vice Chancellor of AMET University, Chennai. He is serving as uh, the president of the Association of Indian Universities. He has visited many major countries of the world and has interacted with the authorities and scientists in their universities and their industries. We are sure the Association of Indian Universities is gaining by his wisdom and experience. Now I request Colonel Dr. G. Thiruvasagam to deliver his address. His Excellency, the Vice President of India, Sri Bengaya Naidiji, who is going to join very shortly. Your Excellency, the Governor of Karnataka State, Sri Danwar Jand, your lot, Honorable Vice Chancellor of this esteemed University of Mysore, Sri 
Hemant Kumar Ji, beloved and respected Dr. Pankaj Mittal, Secretary General of Asushana Indian Universities, Honorable Vice President of AAU, Dr. Swasan Das, respected Registrar of this University, Professor Shivappa, Honorable Vice Chancellors of various universities of India, most respected past presidents of AAU and governing council members of the Association of Indian Universities and other participants on the dais and off the dais. Good morning to every one of you. Friends, already the speech of president has been circulated to all of you in the form of a booklet. I have been given only four minutes. So I have to summarize everything. Please uh, allow me to bring out you few highlights of my speech. As I stand before you to deliver this presidential address of the Association of Indian Universities as its 100th president, I am humbled by thoughts of the long history, rich traditions and significant contributions made by our association towards the progress and development of higher education of India. I am delighted to join with the academic leaders of the India in extending sincere thanks to Professor G. Kemanda Kumar, the Vice Chancellor of the 106 years old University of Mysore for hosting this national conference of AAU. It's pleasure indeed to have the conference as set amidst this beautiful historical temple of Mysore, which was built by Sri Krishnamaraja Udayar III in 17th century. Having been Vice Chancellor of 16 years, I have assumed office as president with a strong intention and the certitude that I can make a contribution to the progress of Indian higher education system. As you are well aware, I took over the president of AAU at the height of COVID-19 pandemic. Sorry to disturb you. You have seven minutes, sir. Not okay. four minutes. Thank you. Please. Thanks for extension of time. Thank you. I took it over as a president of the AAU at the height of COVID-19 pandemic, which was affected the normal functioning of all the education institutions around the world. Despite the restrictions, during this one year period, I have tried to ensure that the activities of the association continue unabated and with the same theme and spirit. While the achievements of AAU in 2021-22, I would like to share a few highlights with you. Several committees were constituted to examine the major issues encountered by the universities and vice chancellors. They are National Education Policy 2020 Implementation Committee, Ranking, Rating, Grading and Accreditation Committee, Students' Welfare Committee, Disabled Welfare Committee, Consultancy Incubation and Entrepreneurship Committee, Bylaw Revision Committee. These reports will be submitted to the Ministry of Education and the chairpersons of the concerned affects bodies like University Grants Commission, AICTE, NAC, NARF, and the copies will be handed over during the conference as well. The present building of AAU at New Delhi is very old, needs a major overhaul. Visiting vice chancellors and other dignitaries also recommended renovating the premises, and therefore, the renovation of the building is being undertaken with a budget of rupees 5 crores. The renovation work will be completed within another six months, after which the visiting vice chancellors will have comfortable stay in the guest house, and the university can have their meetings in the upcoming state-of-the-art conference facilities, which are going to come at AAU. Realizing the growing importance of internalization of higher education, the AAU has taken initiative to establish Indian Network for Internalization of Higher Education, a consortium of potential universities committed to promote the internalization of higher education. To further this goal, the AAU is going to publish an international standard research journal, AAU International Journal for Research and Public Policies from April 2022. The AAU has instituted as a 
token of recognition and appreciation of the faculty and students. Several new accolades and honors, including AAU awards and certificates in the name of Dr. Radha Krishnan Award to the best teacher researcher in each university. AAU awards and certificate to the teacher who has published an article with the highest impact factor of each university. AAU Best PhD Thesis Award, AAU Best Student Award, AAU Best Sports Person Award. Then come to the theme of the conference of sustainable development goals. It's not a compulsion, it's only your option as well, right now before us. As narrated in your address, Dr. Pankaj Mittal, we have to pay much attention in our education institutions which is going to give you a fruitful research, not only to our India, but also globally as well. In 2015, the Department of Economics and Social Affairs of United Nations shared a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now into the future. This blueprint was adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015. As its heart are the 17 sustainable development goals, which are an urgent call for action of all countries developed and developing in global partnership. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand in strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. My dear friends, what is the role to be played by higher education institutions like us? The colleges and universities are expected to contribute not only to their local communities, but also to the global community as well. What better way to do so them to advocate for governments to keep their commitments to implement these 17 goals and to contribute to the body of knowledge around the SDGs. Additionally, universities are expected to instill their graduates with a well-rounded education and global awareness. The SDGs framework models a systematic approach for students understand that success in addressing issues they are passionate about depends on success in addressing other issues, including on their own campuses, institutional partnership within universities, and facilitate engagement with the government and communities at different levels to achieve SDGs as described below. My dear friends, universities have the capacity to generate, translate, and uh, yeah, now well has come. I have a lot of things about national education policy, okay, and many other things as well. You we have to say a few words on it. In July last year, India unveiled the first and most comprehensive education policy of the 21st century. And there are a lot of challenges. In the last 17 months since the eventful launch, NEP has moved some ground in terms of meeting on key milestones. These are all the challenges we have to meet out. And all these uh, challenges I have mentioned in my speech, which has been given to you. Two more issues I want to stress in this meeting. Autonomy of the universities. Autonomy is highly essential for higher education institutions to achieve excellence as it's offer greater scope for creativity and innovation in all its parts. And my dear friends, unless we have autonomy, I can be very frank with you, whatever way we get guidelines from University Grants Commission, it is highly difficult for us to implement the national education policy as it is given in the policy itself. Finally, we vice chancellors are committed to ensure quality higher education by promoting effective academic and research ecosystem in India. We want the flexibility and freedom in the higher education system. Moreover, we are very serious to take forward NEP 2020 by adopting the regulations notification of the AFEX bodies. Okay. We are delighted to see the newly appointed chairman UGC, Professor Mavidala Jagadish Kumar. He is a proactive, dynamic and participative decision maker. He is very keen in translating NEP 2020 in the form of regulations notifications, which are our long-term expectations. Dear Vice Chancellors, each one of us present here are convinced, committed towards achieving the goals 
ensuring that quality and excellence are at the forefront of sustainable in Indian higher education and will remain there for centuries to come. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I may be kindly be pardoned because we are orienting ourselves to the arrival of the Honorable Vice President of India on screen. So I may be pardoned for this intervention. And also we are getting to welcome the Honorable Governor a little later. Now, release of uh, two publications, University News, a journal of higher education and a book titled Implementing National Education Policy 2020 a roadmap edited by Dr. Pankaj Mithal and Dr. S. Ramadevi Pani. Now, I request all the dignitaries to do the office. I request the Honorable Governor to release these two publications. University News, a journal of higher education and a book, Implementing National Education Policy 2020, a roadmap. The editors have been Dr. Pankaj Mittal and Dr. S. Ramadevi Pani. Thank you, sirs and uh, madams. This is the University News, a journal of higher education. Thank you, sirs and uh, madams. As the governor of Karnataka and also as the chancellor of the universities, Dr. Tawarchand Gehlot has endeared himself to both the general public and the academia. His long experience in public life has enabled him to acquire the maturity and vision of an elder statesman. I request the Honorable Governor to deliver a speech. Is Samaro me virtual madhyam se upasthit. भारत के उपराष्ट्रपति आदरणीय एम वेंकैया नायडू जी मैसूर विश्वविद्यालय के वाइस चांसलर श्री जी हेमंत कुमार जी एआईयू के अध्यक्ष कर्नल डॉक्टर जी तिरुवासगम जी एआईयू की जनरल सेक्रेटरी Dr. Shrimati Pankaj Mittal Ji, Mysore Vishwavidhyalaya Ke Registrar Shri R. Sivappa Ji, Desh Ke Vibhinna Vishwavidhyalaya Se Padhara Yove, Upkulpati Gan, Kulpati Gan, Sammanani Atiti Gan Evam Media Ke Sadash Gan, मैं आप सबका इस कार्यक्रम में हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं अभिनंदन करता हूं आपको इस बात की जानकारी होगी कि यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ मैसूर 1916 में स्थापित हुई थी और लगातार 105 वर्षों से अधिक समय से शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में 
उच्चतम स्थान पर सेवाएं दे रही है निश्चित रूप से आज के इस एजीएम बैठक में और सम्मेलन में जिन विषयों पर आप चर्चा करने वाले हैं उन विषयों पर विचार विमर्श करके अच्छा निष्कर्ष निकालने का अवसर होगा और उसका लाभ देश के शिक्षा जगत को मिलेगा सरकार को भी आपके निष्कर्षों पर विचार विमर्श करके शिक्षा नीति को और मजबूत बनाने का अवसर मिलेगा आप सब जानते हैं कि हमारा देश ज्ञान और विज्ञान और व्यवहारिक शिक्षा के कारण विश्व गुरु कहलाता रहा है आज भी इसकी महती आवश्यकता है और आपके विचार विमर्श से जो निष्कर्ष निकलेंगे निश्चित रूप से उस पर अमल करने से यह देश शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में फिर से विश्व गुरु होगा 21वीं सदी भारत की सदी होगी ऐसा मेरा विश्वास है सामाजिक आर्थिक परिवर्तन करके समाज को आत्मनिर्भर बनाने सामाजिक समानता समृद्धि उत्कृष्टता सशक्तिकरण उद्यमिता और ज्ञानोदय के लिए सभी को मूल्यवान शिक्षा हेतु राष्ट्रीय शिक्षा नीति 2020 तैयार की गई है मेरे मत में आप इन विषयों पर भी विचार विमर्श करेंगे और इसके अनुरूप कौशल और मूल्य आधारित समग्र बहु विषय शिक्षा प्रदान करने के संबंध में दिशा निर्देश प्रदान करेंगे वैश्विक स्तर पर किसी भी व्यवसाय या उद्योग को सफल बनाने के लिए विशेषज्ञों की आवश्यकता होती है ऐसे विशेषज्ञों को तैयार करने के लिए पाठ्यक्रम उच्च कोटि के हो इस प्रकार की आवश्यकता है उन पाठ्यक्रमों को उसी समर्पित भाव से पढ़ाने वाले शिक्षा संस्थान और शिक्षा जगत के सभी महानुभाव हो इस प्रकार के प्रयास की आवश्यकता है इस पर भी आप विचार विमर्श करके अपने सुझाव देंगे बच्चों एवं युवाओं को भविष्य की सही राह दिखाने और देश में समावेशी विकास को बढ़ावा देने के लिए यह आवश्यक है कि शिक्षा क्षेत्र में प्रौद्योगिकी को बढ़ावा दिया जाए शिक्षकों के प्रशिक्षण की व्यवस्था की जाए समावेशी शिक्षा प्रणाली पर जोर दिया जाए गुणवत्तापूर्ण शिक्षा को बढ़ावा दिया जाए शिक्षा मानवीय और सदविचार पर चलने के लिए प्रेरणादायी हो इस प्रकार की व्यवस्था की जाना चाहिए और मैं सोचता हूं कि आप इन सब बिंदुओं को ध्यान में रख कर के विचार विमर्श करेंगे भारत सरकार द्वारा 2015 में अपनाए गए सतत विकास एजेंडा अनुसार 2030 तक सभी के लिए समावेशी और समान गुणवत्ता युक्त शिक्षा सुनिश्चित करने और जीवन पर्यंत शिक्षा के अवसरों को बढ़ावा दिए जाने का लक्ष्य है हम सब जानते हैं कि नित नई नई विकासिक योजनाएं हमारे सामने आती है और उनका अध्ययन जरूरी है हमको हर समय एक विद्यार्थी के रूप में उनको सीखने का प्रयास करते रहना चाहिए देश के विकास में सहभागी बनाने के लिए युवाओं को ज्ञान और प्रौद्योगिकी 
नवीनतम विधाओं से परिचित कराने की आवश्यकता है जिससे यह आसपास के प्राकृतों और अपनी कार्यदक्षता का उपयोग कर स्वरोजगार और प्रेरित होकर देश के विकास में अपना योगदान दे सके युवाओं को कुशल बनाकर हम वोकल फॉर लोकल की दिशा में आगे बढ़ सकते हैं आत्मनिर्भर बनाने भारत बनाने के लिए युवाओं को स्किलिंग अप स्किलिंग व रीस्किलिंग पर फोकस करना अत्यंत महत्वपूर्ण है मैं मेरी शुभकामनाएं देता हूं कि इस सम्मेलन में इन सब विचारों पर विषयों पर विचार विमर्श किया जाएगा और सही और अच्छे निष्कर्ष हमारे सामने आएंगे ताकि शिक्षा जगत में भारत तो विश्व में सिरमौर हो सके इसी आशा और विश्वास के साथ आदरणीय उपराष्ट्रपति जी लाइन पर हैं मैं अधिक समय नहीं लेना चाहता हूं आप सबको हार्दिक बधाई देता हूं शुभकामनाएं देता हूं आपके उज्जवल भविष्य की कामना करते हुए अपनी बात समाप्त करता हूं धन्यवाद जय हिंद जय भारत थैंक यू वेरी मच सर द ऑनरेबल वाइस प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ इंडिया श्री वेंकैया नायडू जी हैज जॉइंड अस एंड ही विल बी डिलीवरिंग हिज स्पीच ऑनलाइन आफ्टर द इंट्रोडक्शन बाय आवर रिस्पेक्टेड वाइस चांसलर प्रोफेसर जी हेमंत कुमार हेलोर गो नमस्कार वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू ऑल ऑनरेबल वाइस प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ इंडिया Shri M. Venkayya Naidu, Honorable Governor and Chancellor Shri Thawar Chand Dhalat, President of Association of Indian Universities, Dr. G. Thiruvazagam, Secretary General of AAU, Dr. Mrs. Pankaj Bittal, members of the Syndicate, Academic Council members, Vice Chancellors of the various universities, all our former Vice Chancellors of our university. i am invited to dignitaries and media persons it gives me immense pleasure to welcome the dignitaries and all the guests to this audience before that i will say few words about the path our illustrious university has traversed in the cause of education during last 105 years history is nothing but the trajectory of the march of ideas it is the ideas that has been molded the human society from its infancy onwards the intellectual leaders have played their part in guiding us and maintain the most precious gift to the humanity humanity namely learning and education this conference represents the confluence of ap- academic administrators drawn from the length and breadth of the country i must thank association of uh, indian universities for facilitating and the historic gathering of intellectuals in the city of mysore the association of indian university is a registered body basically formed to promote and represent higher education system on national and international forums thus aiu do is doing the human service the university of mysore is working in tune with the guidance given by the founding fathers whose motto was to take the cause of learning to the doorsteps of the common people apart from the serving of higher education we are giving equal attention to both science and humanities we are seeing the advantages of the balanced approach i have a pleasant duty of welcoming the dignitaries honorable vice president of india shri m venkaiya naidu ji has rich experience in public life serving in many portfolios as distinguished union minister as the union minister of urban development and information broadcasting she has set a few benchmarks as vice president of india from 2017 till the date shri venkaiya naidu ji has lent dignity to the office and is a true leader of the society he is leading from the uh, leading in front of the people in large and guiding the people an orator of rare kind shri 
ವೆಂಕಯ್ಯ ನಾಯ್ಡುಜಿ ಎನ್ ಲೈಟನ್ಸ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಆಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ವಿಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ ಬೈ ದ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ವಿಸ್ಡ್ ಐ ಟೇಕ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಹಾನರಬಲ್ ವೈಸ್ ಪ್ರೆಸಿಡೆಂಟ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಎಂ ವೆಂಕಯ್ಯ ನಾಯ್ಡುಜಿ the honorable vice president of uh, india to this inaugural session to deliver the address online the honorable governor, governor of karnataka shri thavarchand gaurak is serving as the state since 11th july 212021 and he has been already endeared endeared himself to the people of karnataka by his noble qualities he has served as the minister of social justice and empowerment from 2014 to 2021 as the leader of house in the upper in the upper house dr tawar tawar chand gholat has showed a wisdom in the discussion and the issues with which with, with calmness and assurance he has been awarded as a honorary doctorate by b r ambedkar university of social sciences from 1996 to 2009 he is the member of parliament representing in madhya pradesh as the governor of karnataka shri thavar chand ghalat as guiding the state with the rich experience in the public life it is pleasure to welcome dr thavar thavar chand ghalat the chancellor for the inauguration of this conference i welcome you sir dr ch tiruvasagam the president of association of indian universities new delhi at present he is also serving as vice chancellor of amity university chennai indeed it is a honor to welcome you sir i take this opportunity to welcome dr mrs pankaj mittal the secretary general of association of indian universities dr pankaj mittal is much accomplished academic academician with rich experience i deem it privilege to welcome you welcome her i welcome you madam i welcome all the vice chancellors who have traveled from far off places for the 96th annual meet and the vice chancellors national conference i welcome the invitees syndicate and academic council members all our former vice chancellors all my colleagues of my university and the members of media i once again extend warm welcome to the dignitaries on the dais and of the dais thanking you all thank you sir the honorable vice president of india is a rare luminary of a rare kind who enlightens audiences with uh, wit humor and oratorical brilliance as recalled by our honorable vice chancellor his association with karnataka has been a long standing one this all india conference of vice chancellors will gain immensely by his guidance and enlightening counsel i request the honorable vice president of india to address the conference honorable uh, governor of karnataka sri tawarchand gadhod ji vice chancellors senior academic faculty distinguished dignitaries and all others who have all joined this conference today friends it is my pleasure to need to address such a distinguished gadaks of intellectuals who are the academic captains of our country i was informed that the, along with the vice chancellor the executive heads of apex bodies in higher education and senior academic faculty members of indian universities have also congregated to discuss and deliberate on crucial issues like sustainable development goals in this meet before i share my views let me compliment each one of you for being part of this meet organized by the association of indian universities it is heartening to note that this prestigious organization is one of the oldest flagship bodies of universities in the world it is also a matter of delight that stalwarts like dr sam prasad mukherji dr sarepal radhakrishna dr jakir hussain dr al modriyar and many more eminent educationists and astute statesmen adorned this organization as presidents today when uh, au is celebrating its uh, 96th foundation day i deem it an honor to address you all 
on how the Indian education institutions can play a vital role in uh, realizing the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. As you are all aware, the United Nations have set this sustainable development goal comprising 17 sustainable development goals was signed by most countries more than seven years ago. The recent United Nations report indicate that the progress achieved in these goals is uneven and that more needs to be done. According to the 21 report, three Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, and Denmark, top the list. Countries like Germany, Australia, and UK and Spain are in the top 20. And in the list, India is in the 120th position. This is a matter that has to be taken seriously. We must remember the fact that saving the planet out to be a collective effort of all countries. We can ill afford to lose sight of the relevance of the adage, Osudaika Kutumbakam, in this context. India is the second largest population. It's one of the critical countries where the achievements of the sustainable development goals will be essential to realize the 2030 agenda in the next decade. Poverty and illiteracy are challenges we need to surmount as a society in our quest to achieve sustainable development goals. Other factors which are hindering our march towards the progress, child malnutrition, gender inequality, equitable access to safe water, and environmental pollution. Thus, there is a long road ahead that needs to traverse to achieve the SDG Agenda 2030. Niti Aayog has created a national framework to work towards achieving these goals. The Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation is assisting Niti Aayog, interacting with other ministries and developing indicators on SDG goals and targets. As is evident, achieving these goals is not the responsibility of any particular organization ministry or government. It needs a concerted effort from all stakeholders, including civil society, industries, NGOs, and most importantly, our educational institutions. The contribution of educational institutions is of critical importance. Primary, secondary, and higher education institutions need to be consciously adopt practices that lead to the achievement of SDGs. Colleges and universities have a bigger role to play in this regard. It's very key for this achieving these goals. They can contribute in a number of ways such as research, policy development, and engagement with societies for creating awareness and effective implementation of sustainable development strategies, apart from preparing students for the challenges of the 21st century. As you are all aware, India's higher education sector is the third largest in the world. It is throbbing educational hub with around 1,050 universities, more than 10,000 professional technical institutes, and 42,343 colleges in both the public and private sector. If all our higher education institutions come forward to contribute towards the accomplishment of goals, our achievement will be very significant and it will make a major impact on the overall world scenario. Unfortunately, so far, most of the higher education institutions have remained almost disconnected in the SDG Agenda 2030. When it comes to integration of the SDGs in the operation of higher education institutions, we still have a long way to go. So I congratulate the Association of Indian Universities and its president, Dr. Thiruvasagam, and other members for taking this initiative in conducting these brainstorming sessions in this seminar towards realizing these SDG goals. My dear Vice Chancellors and distinguished Gurus, as you are all aware, India has a glorious past. Knowledge generation, application, and dissemination to the world. The existence of universities like Naranda, Takshasila, Vikramsila, Vallabhi, and Vadanpuri in ancient India bear ample testimony to the fact that India had an age old of tradition of education and learning which has made it Vasvaguru 
at one time. The essence of the ancient knowledge systems of India in the form of Vedas and Upanishads, Puranas, Itihas, among others, the greatness of Indian culture and the traditional lifestyle of Indians have been passed on from generation to generation till today. The versatility of our knowledge systems and culture and their enduring significance make them relevant forever. For example, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, the most popular prayer of Indians in which we pray God to keep all beings happy would be an everlasting wish of all individuals and society. Today, India stands poised on the threshold of a world of historic responsibilities and opportunities. It is now one of the emerging superpowers with improved education, development of resources and jobs, better infrastructure and health care, among others. The NEP, the New Education Policy, is a foresighted document which is bound to transform the educational landscape of our country. Its recommendations are aligned with the SDGs and its scope and vision encompasses complete overhauling of the Indian education system from pre-primary to higher education and along with curriculum reform to institutional reform in a phased manner. We need to overhaul, overhaul our education system. I am, comp I am certain that implementation of this policy and in letter and spirit will help us to achieve the SDG agenda. As I understand, there will be discussion on all the SDGs in various sessions, which will primarily address the role of colleges and universities in giving an impetus to the larger objective of accomplishing SDGs. Exchange of ideas, knowing from others' experience. That is very vital. Besides, I learned that there will be a stock taking of global progress towards achieving these goals. It is important to share knowledge as I was telling, highlight success stories and good practices. At the same time, it is also important to identify areas of concern and challenges and suggest the way forward in terms of action for higher education institutions, government, and other stakeholders. I welcome aspect. This particular aspect is that it points for higher education institutions. They will recover in all the three dimensions, teaching, research, and community development. Let me share another deep-seated wish of mine that is to see Indian universities ranked among the top 10 universities of the world. That is the wish of the people of India. All universities should set higher standards in academic excellence, including research, knowledge creation, and focus on infrastructure development by ensuring equitable access to education. I also feel that the private sector also has got a bigger role. We must promote a public-private partnership. Government alone cannot do this. So it is also the duty of private sector to join this endeavor. I also congratulate the AAU for its 96 years of successful journey and convey my best wishes for all the future endeavors. As I told you, my dear friends, we have a great challenge. And all of us must join together to face that challenge and again make India as Vishwaguru once again. That should be our endeavor. I wish you all the best. Parliament is in session, so I have to go to Parliament. That's why I'm not able to spend much of the time. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Jai Hind. Ladies and gentlemen, as expected, the Honorable Vice President of India has made many pertinent points regarding higher education, which is expected to accomplish certain goals, especially his clarion call to Indianize education is very well taken. We are indeed grateful to you, sir, for your wise counsel. Thank you very much, sir. Professor R. Shiopa, the Registrar of the University of Mysore, is an expert in social work with an especial orientation towards community participation in rural development. A fellowship from Denmark in the year 2000 was a turning point which catapulted him to a higher realm of scholastic pursuit, and he has never looked back ever since. I request our beloved registrar, Professor R. Shiopa, to propose a vote of thanks.
a very good morning on this special day for all of us in our esteemed great university it is a great pleasure honor to propose vote of thanks to all the dignitaries on the dais of the dais and also who are actively watching this special program online from all over india first and foremost i express my sincere thanks to shri m venkaiya naidu ji honorable vice president of india for his thought provoking inspiring motivating guiding speech indeed it is a historical and highly significant in the context of university of mysore and association of indian universities and for all of us so on behalf of association of indian universities and university of mysore i sincerely thank highly respected honorable vice president shri m y m venkaiya naidu ji pranams to you sir honorable governor of karnataka shri tawarchand gehlot ji has blessed and addressed all of us which was direction showing and visionary from the point of view of higher education in india my sincere thanks to honorable governor governor sir on behalf of association of indian universities and university of mysore and all of us i express my sincere thanks to the president who happens to be 100th president of the association of indian universities colonel dr g tiruvasugam sir for his speech which has highlighted the issues concerns of all the universities in india which was very much relevant thank you very much sir my sincere thanks to our beloved respected professor g emant kumar sir who is a 25th vc of our esteemed 100 106 years old university he has brought glory to the university of mysore by starting a college of engineering in the university of mysore and played a pivotal role in the implementation of a new education policy 2020 sir is untiringly working towards upgrading the university of mysore from all respects infrastructure academics and career advancement of both teaching and non teaching fraternity in the university of mysore thank you thank you sir for your great inspirational speech and leading us for a betterment of the university madam dr pankaj mithal who is a secretary general of association of indian universities from the very beginning dr mithal is involved in organizing coordinating at each and every stage along with the university of mysore especially with our highly committed professor n k loknath director pmeb who is coordinating this uh, 96th annual meet of association of indian universities and uh, national conference of vcs in fact dr mithal was very keen and having concern for each and every detail of the conference to make this annual meet and conference a grand success thank you very much madam thanks to all the honorable vice chancellors who are present over here and also on the virtual mode during this annual meet of association of indian universities and national conference of vcs for whom this whole program is meant thanking you all for, thanking you all respected vice chancellors from all over india i express my sincere thanks to all the staff of officers at association of indian universities and university of mysore especially vc secretariat i would like to thank dr h k chetan for having taken the lead role in organizing this conference my thanks to all the members of authorities syndicate and academic council mid deans of all the faculties directors of all the post graduation centers chairpersons of all the post graduation departments professors and principals of all constituent colleges who are present here and also on virtual mode my sincere thanks to all the media persons print digital social media for their constant encouraging positive support coverage of news from time to time i respectfully thank uh, the team who presented national anthem and nada geete last but not the least i thank the program compere professor c nagarna who is a well known scholar poet and literary critic thank you very much sir thank you one and all jai hind jai bharat national anthem
gentlemen the honorable vice president of india leaves now even as the honorable governor and other dignitaries on the dais depart from this hall kindly keep standing while the dignitaries leave the hall and then i have an imo important announcement to make Im immediately immediately after the inaugural function there is a group photo for the vice chancellors of india in front of the hall after the photograph please come back for the foundation day lecture by sri tirumurthi at 10:40 exactly so please join for the photograph in front of the hall and then come back for the foundation day lecture there will be a tea break at 11:30 am this is for your kind information tea break at 11:30 now you join the photograph in front of the crawford hall this very hall only the vice chancellors will go for the photo session the others are requested to stay back kindly be seated i request all of you to kindly be seated the vice chancellors will go and uh, join the photo session immediately the foundation lecture will be delivered by shri tirumurthi the permanent representative of india as on un united nations i request the students to stay put please stay wherever you are the foundation lecture will begin don't scatter away please be there
we are uh, going to witness the foundation day lecture being delivered by sri tirumurthy the permanent representative of the united nations and uh, now i request professor on the stage you may have professor upindra dhar vice chancellor sri vaishnav vidyapeet indore we have uh, professor paranjit jaswal vice chancellor srm university sonipat dr jagannath patnaik vice chancellor ikfai university sikkim professor sita ramrao dr b r ambedkar open university hyderabad and uh, our own vice chancellor is to be here on stage along with them is dr pankaj mittal the secretary general of the great organization now before much adieu i request professor upindra dhar vice chancellor shri vaishnav vidyapeet indore to introduce the speaker of the day uh, to all of us over to you sir professor dhar uh i am extremely sorry sir the president of uh i i aiu is very much here in the morning also because of the some kind of disorientation that we all of us experienced because of the august presence of the vice president of india online i had to intervene and uh, you know rearrange the time of the speech as directed by the governor of uh, karnataka and uh, professor um, tirus uh, wasagam's introduction was very very epitomized i plead my uh, i feel guilty about it because of the paucity of time sir thank you over to professor upinder dhar president of aiu dr g thiruvasegam ji dr pankaj mittal my fellow governing council members illustrious past presidents professor pv sharma and professor ds chauhan all vice chancellors sitting in the august gathering and students it is my pride privilege to introduce and welcome ambassador ts tirumurthy permanent representative of india to the united nations ambassador tirumurthy is a career indian diplomat with extensive multilateral experience since joining the us in 1985 he has represented india india's the country's interests in various capacities prior to taking over his current assignment in may 2020 as the permanent representative of india to the united nations in new york ambassador tirumurthy was the secretary in the ministry of external affairs handling the economic relations portfolio since february 2018 which included intralia gulf and the arab world africa and india's development partnership ambassador ts tirumurthy previously served at the indian embassy in cairo egypt and at the permanent mission of india in geneva switzerland he was also the first indian representative to the palestinian authority in gaza and later counselor at the indian embassy 
in Washington, D.C., United States. He was Deputy Chief of Mission at the Indian Embassy in Jakarta, Indonesia, and India's High Commissioner to Malaysia. Ambassador Tirumurthy served as Under Secretary Bhutan, Director Foreign Secretary's Office, Joint Secretary. Myanmar and Maldives, and Joint Secretary, United Nations Economic and Social Department. During his stints at the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi. He is currently also the chair of Counter-Terrorism Committee of the United Nations Security Council for the year 2022. Ambassador Tirumurthy has bachelor's degrees in commerce and law. He is also the author of three books. As we can see from the short profile, Ambassador Tirumurthy is a man of wide experience and superior intellect. Ladies and gentlemen, it will be a great pleasure to listen to him today. With these words, I would like to invite Ambassador Tirumurthy to deliver the AIU Foundation Lecture. Thank you. Over to Ambassador Tirumurthy. Good morning to all of you. Distinguished dignitaries on the dais, Colonel Dr. G. Thiruasagam, President of the AIU, Dr. Mrs. Pankaj Mittal, Secretary General of the AIU, Professor Upinder Dhar, Vice Chancellor Sri Vaishnav Vidyapit Indore, Professor G. Hemanta Kumar, Vice Chancellor Mysore University, Dr. Alok Mishra, Joint Secretary of the AIU, Distinguished Vice Chancellors, and educationists, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a singular honor to deliver the Foundation Day Lecture of the Association of Indian Universities at the 96th Annual General Meet and National Seminar of Vice Chancellors at the University of Mysore. At the outset, allow me to acknowledge the trailblazing role which the Association of Indian Universities has played over the decades as the premier apex higher education institution. All of us have benefited by AIU in one way or another, which includes overseas universities from other countries as well. I commend the tremendous service which AIU is rendering to promote the vision of sustainable education. I'm also delighted that this meeting is being held in another premier academic institution of India, the University of Mysore. My intention today is to give you an overview of India's journey in the United Nations, especially in the UN Security Council in recent years. The last two years has been particularly significant in the context of India's presence in the UN. We celebrated the 75th anniversary of the UN last year. And this year, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of India's independence. And in this period, India was elected to the UN Security Council for the eighth time for a two-year term, 2021-2022. The 75th anniversary of the United Nations has a special resonance for India. Not many realize that even before we gained independence, India was among the founding signatories of the UN Charter at the historic San Francisco Conference in 1945. It was Sir Arkot Ramasamy Mudaliyar and Sir V.T. Krishnamachari who signed this charter in June 1945 on behalf, of the, on behalf of British India and of the princely states, respectively. India has had many distinguished luminaries, including women, who have made tremendous contribution to shape the UN in its initial years. This included Sir Ramasamy Mudaliyar himself, who had the unique distinction of serving as the first president of the United Nations Economic and Social Council, the ECOSOC. Srimati Vijayalakshmi Pandit was the first woman 
to serve as the president of the general assembly we had other luminaries like dr hansa mehta shrimati lakshmi menon begum sharifa hamid ali etc who played a pioneering role in shaping some of the agenda of the united nations what is equally important for us to keep in mind is that when we look at india's journey in the united nations we not only spoke for india but also for all developing countries long before some of them even secured their own independence in many ways we were the voice of the developing world until today we continue to be the voice of the developing world while united nations is coming for criticism especially in the recent past let us not forget that the united nations has been a major force in ensuring that multilateralism is firmly entrenched and international issues are decided in a world governed by un charter conventions agreements and rules among member states over the years some of the major achievements include decolonization combating apartheid environment related convention especially climate change sustainable development goals development initiatives gender related issues focus on human rights etc as is sometimes pointed out the world before the united nations had multipolarity but not multilateralism and it was it was only after the united nations gave a multilateral structure to multipolarity that we have had engagement and inclusive involvement from all member states in shaping the future every era has had its challenges and india has been widely perceived as a country which bridges divides speaks for what is just and takes the world forward in a positive direction in an inclusive and consensual manner when we look around the challenges we have now is no less than any time before in history the world is being wrecked by a devastating pandemic which is not abating even after 2 years it is already wiping out much of the socio economic gains made by developing countries we have fissures and divisions between countries on the basis of politics religion development ideologies etc conflicts are only increased inequalities in development is widening climate change threatens all of us and nobody is being spared least of all small island developing states and terrorism has expanded its tentacles to new areas especially to africa ladies and gentlemen it is in this context that india was elected to a two year stint in the security council we have been quick to rise up to the challenges posed both inside and outside the security council on international peace and security front the highlight of india's presence in the security council so far was certainly our presidency in august last year it was a presidency that saw several historic firsts the most significant being that for the first time the prime minister of india chaired a high level security council meeting the council adopted a presidential statement for the first time capturing the holistic concept of maritime security including the un convention on the law of the seas unclos freedom of navigation piracy terrorism at sea etc maritime security remains a priority focus of india on other matters of international peace and security we did not hesitate to put forward our views firmly and protect our national interests for example it was during our presidency in august last year that the security situation in afghanistan rapidly deteriorated requiring the security council to act without any delay we did so with the urgency it deserved a crucial resolution 2593 was adopted under our presidency which clearly set out our collective expectations that afghan soil should not be used for terrorism against other countries called for safeguards for protection of women and minorities for inclusive governance and for urgent humanitarian assistance our approach will be guided by these expectations from the international community and by our own close and historic links with the afghan people we have delivered life saving humanitarian assistance and vaccines to the afghan people and now in the process of fulfilling our pledge of 50000 tons of wheat 
India has also been chairing the Taliban Sanctions Committee in the Council at this critical time. Another example is the recent conflict in Ukraine. We have consistently called for immediate cessation of hostilities and called on parties to take the path of diplomacy and dialogue. Prime Minister himself has spoken to the leaders of both the Russian Federation and Ukraine several times, especially to ensure the safe evacuation and return of all our nationals. Under Operation Ganga, till date, over 22,500 Indians have returned home safely, though an Indian student from Karnataka tragically lost his life. My deepest condolences to his family. More than 90 flights have crisscrossed the skies to bring our nationals home, even nationals from other countries. We will continue to remain engaged in developments in Ukraine. In all such areas of conflict, including in Myanmar, the Middle East, in parts of Africa, India has successfully played the role of a bridge bringing together divergent views and pushing for consensus so that peace and stability can prevail. Given our historic friendship with Africa, we have made known our views on unjust attempts to burden African countries with unrealistic sanctions regimes. We have supported African regional involvement and African solutions to African problems with sustained financial and logistic support. History has shown that India will always speak for stability, world peace, pluralism, and democracy. Another matter which is high on our national priority and is now of grave concern, not just in South Asia, but in several parts of the world is terrorism. When supported and sponsored by states, terrorism becomes another means of waging war. Even COVID has not stopped countries from supporting terrorism, especially cross-border terrorism as we have seen in our neighborhood and now recently against the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. During our presidency, our external affairs minister chaired a meeting on ISIS and terrorism. This January, India took over as the chair of the important UN Counter-Terrorism Committee for one year. We stand determined that our united stand against terrorism should not be diluted by providing justification for terror in any form. In this, we have firmly rejected religious phobias being used to justify terror or political ideologies in democracies being deliberately misrepresented as radical ideologies to provide fodder for terrorism. Our fight here is not against democracy, but against radical ideologies. We cannot afford to go back to the pre 9-11 era when the world was divided into my terrorist and your terrorists. Terrorists are terrorists. There are no bad ones. There are no good ones. We need collective action. We are strengthening the existing structures like the FATF, etc., to tackle terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, given our predominant role in UN peacekeeping over the years, India continues to be the largest troop contributing country in the world with more than 250,000 troops. We salute the 175 martyrs from India who have paid with their lives to protect civilians around the globe. It will interest you to know that India provided the first woman peacekeeping contingent to the UN when our brave pioneering women police contingent went to Liberia in 2007 for UN peacekeeping where they won accolades from one and all. In many ways, they were following in the illustrious footsteps of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment of Netaji's Indian National Army. During our presidency, we also held a session on technology and peacekeeping, which was another first. We walked the talk by contributing to rolling out a tech platform in the UN peacekeeping missions for protecting the peacekeepers, the Unite Aware platform as well as supplying vaccines for all UN peacekeepers around the world. After nearly five decades, India also piloted a council resolution during our presidency on accountability for crimes against peacekeepers, which was co-sponsored by all members of the council. Friends, 
Honorable Prime Minister has outlined a vision of reformed multilateralism, where he emphasized that India can no longer be kept out of decision-making structures, including that of the United Nations Security Council. Apart from our pioneering contribution to the UN, as the largest democracy with strong pluralistic values, India demands a place in the Reformed Security Council. The membership of the UN has increased from 51 in 1945 to 193 now. It's untenable that the Security Council continues to reflect the Cold War era frozen in the 1940s, as a result of which it has become increasingly ineffective and unrepresentative in the 21st century. Consequently, its decisions, its decision making has suffered. We have seen several recent examples of this. Other plurilateral structures like the G20, BRICS, Quad, IPSA, etc., are now taking its place to cater to inter, uh, inter alia diverse interests and to countries demanding a place in the decision making structures. However, a small group of countries in the UN are opposing such reform and holding up the entire process as a hostage. They are not only standing in our way, but also in the way of the entire African continent, for example, which does not have any permanent representation in the council. This anomaly needs to be corrected if the UN has to be more responsive to the changed world. We have already seen the UN struggle to respond to the COVID pandemic and other issues which need our immediate and concerted action. Procrastination is no more an option. Climate change is undoubtedly a major issue which need our collective and immediate attention. India has been second to none in combating climate change, and we have taken on even more ambitious goals in the recently concluded Glasgow Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC last year. However, instead of operationalizing the decisions under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, the developed countries tried last December to bring the issue of climate change into the Security Council in an attempt to override the consensus-based approach of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We saw the attempt for what it, what it was, namely to have the Security Council take over the climate change agenda and take decisions without the involvement of most developing countries. It sought to undermine the hard-won consensus in other forums and undermine the principles and provisions of the UNFCCC and hand over the responsibility to a body which neither works through consensus nor is reflective of the interest of developing countries. India voted against the resolution in the Security Council, which in fact was eventually vetoed. We remain resolute in our position that we will support real climate action and climate justice. We call on developed countries to fulfill their 2030 Paris commitments to begin with, including in the critical areas of mitigation, financing, adaptation, and transfer of technology. Let us not forget that for countries like the small island developing states, this is an existential challenge. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you are gathered here to discuss sustainable development goals through higher education institutions. As the Honorable Vice President of India mentioned just now, it is our common endeavor that we, as India, fulfill our commitments towards SDGs. I had the privilege of taking part in Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012, where the first building blocks for the SDGs was put in place. It may interest you to know that at that time, not everyone was looking at a negotiated process in the UN to finalize the SDGs. They wanted to do it like the MDGs, which is the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were not negotiated by the UN member states, but merely handed down by the UN Secretary General for countries to implement. In Rio Plus 20 in 2012, the developed countries were interested in doing the same thing for the SDGs as well, which is to have a non-negotiated process. At the Rio Plus 20 conference, primarily due to the efforts of countries like India, Brazil, and others, who insisted that these negotiations be done in the United Nations by all member states, a member states-driven process in the UN was finally agreed to. Now, 
The SDGs truly belong to all member states of the UN, and we have a joint stake in implementing them. However, COVID-19 has disrupted decades of developmental progress on many fronts, pushing millions back into poverty. The pandemic has effectively squeezed the funds available to achieve Agenda 2030 in this decade of action. When we look at mobilizing finance for sustainable developments or for climate change, let us not forget that we are looking at predictable and adequate financing, not innovative accounting. The developed countries are far from fulfilling their pledge on financing. India stands as an example of taking holistic, coherent, and an integrated approach at the national, regional, and subnational levels to achieve the sustainable development goals. We have successfully localized the SDGs. In fact, the UN has itself appreciated our localization of SDGs, for example, through our aspirational district programs and has held this up as a very successful model of local area development. The UN has in fact appreciated many of the other citizen-centric policies of our government as well. Friends, while I have tried to highlight some important priority areas, India has also taken other significant initiatives recently in the United Nations. To name just two of them, the Prime Minister's initiative of the International Solar Alliance has recently been given observer status in the United Nations. India's resolution for declaring 2023 as the International Year of Millets has been approved by the UN General Assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, our performance in the UN Security Council, as well as the important role we continue to play in shaping the multilateral affairs again vindicates why the world needs India to be in the Security Council permanently. Friends, I once again thank the Association of Indian Universities for this great privilege to deliver the AIU Foundation Day Lecture. I wish the AIU and all the distinguished educationists and vice chancellors and all the others assembled here success in their deliberations on sustainable development goals during the conference. I thank you and Jay Hind. Thank you, Ambassador Sri Tirumurti, permanent representative of India to United Nations. It was indeed an informative and inspiring speech. We all enjoyed it. And it will be registered in the annals in the history of AIU. Uh, starting as a wide-eyed startup in 1925, the Association of Indian Universities has grown into such a big organization, playing an indispensable role in the Indian higher education system. Uh, whereas many organizations have started time to time after that, they have gone into oblivion. Association of Indian Universities very resi resiliently and resolutely uh, undertook the journey and became a very strong institution. All the vice chancellors uh, deserve congratulations on behalf of everyone. I congratulate all the vice chancellors and uh, it is indeed a matter of celebration. Now I invite Professor K. Sita Ramarao, vice chancellor, B.R. Ambedkar Open University, Hyderabad to propose words of thanks. Sir, please, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Sabak uh, Namaskaram. I, on behalf of Association of Indian Universities and Post University, Mysore University, and on my personal behalf, I feel it a great privilege and honor to propose formal vote of thanks to this great program of AAU Foundation Day Lecture organized by, combinedly by both AAU and as well as Mysore University. 
So today, really, we are very fortunate enough to listen to highly esteemed Sri Tirumurthi Ji, who is a permanent ambassador and permanent representative of India to the UN in New York. And is a really, is a great personality, Indian diplomat with extensive multilateral experience in diplomacy, foreign policy, and international relations. And also is the chairperson for this current year in UN of Counter-Terrorism Committee of UN, UN Security Council. This is most important dimension. So really, Sri Tirumurthi ji has emphasized many aspects in his lecture, especially the role of India in United Nations. And he always India, he said that he always India played a commendable role in shaping the UN's agenda and its role since its inception. And it always should stood by developing world and became their voice also. And indirectly, he emphasized on need to promote quality directed and quality oriented international and global studies and also sustainable development studies by the Indian universities. Really, it is all, uh, in a way, it is our responsibility we have to take a lesson and from his great talk today, he delivered to us. So, he also emphasized on many aspects. India always stood for world peace, democracy, stability, development, and various other progressive dimensions of mankind in a way it should go forward. So really, I once again extend my heartfelt thanks to Sri Tirumurthu ji for who is kind enough to accept the invitation and deliver a thought provoking and very interesting lecture to the vice chancellors on this occasion. And also, I thank the organizers, especially our Honorable President, Professor Tiruvasagam, and the respected Secretary General, Dr. Pankaj Mittal, Madam, and also uh, our highly respected Chancellor Sri Hemant Kumarji, and also Registrar Professor Shivappa for all necessary arrangements he made, and also EC members along with me on the dais, Professor Upendra Dhar, Jagannath Patnaik, Paramjit Jaswal, and other friends. I also extend my thanks to AU staff who are really working hard continuously since a long time, especially Rama Pani, Vijendra Kumar. And also I thank the faculty members of non-teach faculty members, non-teaching, research scholars, students who made this program a grand success uh, in this historical higher education hub of Indian uh, India, that is Mysore University. I thank you one and all. Thanks once again. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for giving me this opportunity.
I would like to get your opinion, Honorable Vice Chancellors. Already we came here by nine o'clock, all along sitting for another two and a half hours. There are two options. The immediate next session is very, very important, interesting session as well. Because the previous zonal conference and all, the apex bodies, they have deputed only advisors, the middle level officers. Luckily, this session, the top level people of apex bodies are going to come for the interaction. So interaction session is more and more important. Every one of us have some grievances with all these bodies like NAC, AACTE, and UGC, and otherwise, you know, NBA and uh, ICAR as well. Top people are coming. What I am requesting, Honorable Vice Chancellor of University of Mysore, he has arranged a small refreshment outside. Or we, we have to go and come back quickly because already all these uh, speakers, they have joined online. They are waiting for us. What is your preference? Or shall we organize tea here itself? I'm, I'm leaving to your choice, you know. I'm just, uh, I'm leaving to your choice. But uh, Vice Chancellor feels, University Vice Chancellor, it's not fair on the part of University of Mysore to give you a cup of tea in the hand and all. If you are able to stick on the time of 10 minutes, you can go and come back. Which one is better, sir? Pardon? We are here only. We are here only. Am I right, sir? Shall we continue? Thank you very much indeed. All of them, please give a big hand to them as well. Okay. Bye. announce so with the permission of chair i am uh, we are continuing with uh, the next session the next session is interface with heads of apex bodies uh, sir has already told you the purpose of this session for this session we have professor suranjan das vice president of association of indian universities and vice chancellor jadavpur university as chair and uh, Dr. Mrs. Pankaj Mittal, Secretary General as co-chair. And uh, the, the heads who have come you know, for this session are Professor Anil D. Sahasrabude, Chairman AICTE, Professor Bhushan Patwardhan, Chairman NAC, Professor K.K. Agrawal, Chairman NBA, and Dr. R.C. Agrawal, DDG Deputy Director General ICAR. I welcome you all uh, to the session, sir. And I now request uh, Madam Pankaj Mittal. Suranjan Das, sir, has not joined. Okay. No. Okay. Sir, I invite uh, Professor Suranjan Das to come over and chair the session. How oh, virtually, sir? Uh, in the meantime. A very good afternoon to all of you. I would also request the host to kindly unmute Dr. Suranjan Das. He is not able to speak and also show his video. If you can pin his video over here. So I'll just give you a background of this session that why we held this session. I mean, for last three years, we are holding this session because many times we have felt that the universities are wanting to talk to the regulatory authorities, but somehow they are not able to reach the heads of the institutions that easily. So therefore, in every zonal as well as the main session, we request the heads of the regulatory bodies and the apex bodies to come and interact with all of you. Normally, they come physically, but this time because of COVID and because of so many urgencies. So they are all joining online, but they'll be available for the question answer session till the end. So if there will be hand mics available to you for raising the questions and all the four chairpersons of the regulatory bodies would be there to answer those questions. So the chair session is Professor Suranjan Das. I'll request Professor Suranjan Das to start and then one by one, he will be inviting all the chairpersons for a talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mittal. Am I audible? 
Professor Mittal, am I audible? Am I audible? We are not able to hear you right now. Are you unmute? Yes. Yes. Am I am I audible? Yes. Now it yeah. is okay. Yeah. Please okay. go ahead. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Mittal. Uh, could I, on my own behalf and on behalf of the Association of Indian University, express sincere gratitude to the four distinguished speakers uh, of the panel, uh, Professor Shaushabude, Professor Patavardhan, Professor K.K. Agarwal, and Professor R.C. Agarwal, for sharing their thoughts on Indian higher education at a time when the Indian higher education itself is on the brink of a fundamental transformation. The AICT, the NAC, the NBA, and the ICAR have been playing pioneering roles in promoting the cause of excellence in Indian higher education system, of course, in tune with the principles of equity and access. And we do look forward to these apex bodies and their captains to play even more constructive roles in the coming days in, the coming days in India. And it is in this context, as Professor Mittal pointed out, this session is of crucial importance. I am particularly thankful to the Honorable Chair President of AIU and the Secretary General of the AIU to give me this opportunity of coordinating this session, especially when I had the very good fortune of working with each of the four speakers in different capacities. With these words, could I first request Professor Shaushabude to make a submission. Professor Shaushabude, please. Sir, so may I request you to first invite Professor Bhushan Patwadhan because we are not able to locate Professor Sahis, but I will just talk to him. Professor Bhushan Patwadhan, sir, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible, but we are not able to see you right now. <laughs> Professor, yes, sir, we are able to see you now. Yeah, I'm Thank in this, so my uh, connection may not be that good, but uh, let's see. Nice to see you, Professor Subhanjan Das. Namaskar Sapko uh, and uh, thank you AIU, uh, Professor Mithil, the President of AIU uh, and Vice President of AIU. Uh, I, I will uh, not take much time because uh, I would like to spend time uh, on interaction, but just to give you uh, some brief, you know, I've just uh, three weeks ago, uh, I have uh, taken over as uh, chairperson of the executive committee uh, of uh, National Assessment and Accreditation Council. Uh, uh, you may know that this NAC, what popularly it is known as, uh, that was created in response to recommendation of National Policy in Education 1986. And uh, UGC established NAC uh, the same year, actually, to serve the function of quality assurance. Uh, to understand the mechanism for quality assurance, uh, there was need uh, to have uh, such an institute and uh, UGC uh, was really uh, uh, very uh, uh, quick in uh, creating NAC at that time. Next year, friends, uh, I'm happy that all the vice chancellors, uh, prominent universities are uh, present in this session. And... Uh, uh, I want to tell you that uh, next year, that is 2023, uh, NAC will be entering the 30th year. Uh, and as we know, the higher education system has gone through several transitions uh, during last three decades. And the uh, uh, approach which NAC had adopted that time, you know, the first chairman of NAC EC uh, was Professor Ganam, one of the outstanding scholar and educationist. And the founder director at that time was Professor Arun Nigavekar, 
with whom I had an opportunity to work as well because he came, he comes from uh, Pune University itself. But the approach, entire approach uh, of uh, the assessment and accreditation uh, has stepwise evolved uh, during this uh, process and the current uh, uh, director, Professor S.C. Sharma, uh, has done a lot of good changes during last two years. Uh, earlier, the proportion of uh, peer review visit uh, uh, was a major component in determining grades. Uh, that has now been subsequently uh, replaced with the uh, system-generated documentation-driven uh, uh, weightages. And uh, so the individual uh, biases uh, component has been drastically reduced. You know. But while uh, saying so, uh, in last three weeks, whatever I've observed at NAC, I've realized that uh, the technology is changing now. The digital technology, new technologies are coming up like artificial intelligence, data analytics, a blockchain, and many other advances are happening. And our whole system uh, needs to be uh, get tuned to National Education Policy 2020. NAC was established uh, on the recommendation of uh, National Education Policy uh, in 1986. And now, again, NAC will have to revisit and reimagine our entire process in the light of National Education Policy 2020. And for that purpose, uh, we'll have to uh, revisit, rethink, and reimagine uh, the methodology, uh, the processes, the outputs, uh, the outcomes and align them with NEP uh, 2020 recommendations. Uh, if you see the uh, current approach, you know, uh, the primary focus of current approach is on monitoring. Uh, but the main objective of NAC assessment is not merely monitoring, but raising the bar of quality education. That is the important function of NAC. And uh, to do that, it is necessary uh, to effect significant reforms in the existing system. That's what I have felt. Uh, and uh, I have also realized that during the last 30 years, there has been no systematic effort to take stakeholder satisfaction survey. Now, these days, even if you take a flight, immediately on arrival, you get a message and online satisfaction survey uh, you are invited to participate in. So how was your flight experience? How was your check-in experience? And things like that. So NAC, as one of the uh, major uh, uh, agency uh, giving uh, some kind of service only to the education sector, NAC also should get a stakeholder satisfaction survey, what we call it as SSS. And I have talked uh, uh, to our colleagues and we have decided that very soon, in a week or so, uh, we would like to take or initiate uh, this kind of a survey. And obviously, NAC means not, I don't consider NAC as only one building which is uh, headquarter in Bengaluru. Uh, NAC uh, ultimately uh, also is accountable uh, and also part of the entire education uh, community. And all vice chancellors are important uh, component of this. Many of you have been assessors of NAC as well. You know? So you may have experienced the whole process. You may have some ideas in your mind. You may have some uh, faced some difficulties. We would like to know what is your uh, what are your views on that. And uh, not only this survey, but subsequently uh, we are also uh, going to uh, uh, arrange for some kind of a, a one day. Uh, intense meeting, you know. So before that, I would request AIU to collect and consolidate whatever happens today in this session. And in addition to that also, whatever people may submit to you regarding uh, their expectations from that, please prepare a concise report based on this with clear recommendations and we will certainly look into it. So with this, I will stop. I will not talk uh, much about it now, but I will be available if there are any questions, uh, and also uh, I want to 
uh, thank AIU because you have put so uh, many uh, uh, scholars uh, in this session, Professor uh, Agarwal, uh, you know, uh, who who, uh, who himself is uh, one of the uh, very uh, prominent academician now chairing uh, NBA. Professor Anil Sastrabudde uh, is also uh, my uh, have been my colleague and it was a pleasure to work with him while I was at UGC uh, and uh, Dr. R.C. Agarwal, uh, DDG of uh, ICAR. I look forward for more interaction. Uh, thank you, Professor Das and uh, Dr. Mittal for this opportunity. Namaskar. Jai Hind. Thank you, Professor Patavardhan, for that initial remarks and you rightly uh, emphasize the need to revisit the process of accreditation methodology. And I'm sure on this point, there could be, would be a lot of deliberations in the session. Thank you very much, Professor Potavardhan. Professor Mittal, I, th I, I think uh, Professor Shaushabudha has joined. Can we request him to uh, make his submission? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Professor Shaushabudha, could we please request you to make your submission? Thank you once again for taking your for taking time off for, for your uh, very busy schedule. Uh, uh, Vice President, sir. Now yes, sir. We'll ensure that. Chairperson of NAC will be available for answering questions. Okay, okay, sir. Often okay, sir. Sessions when we rush up, the people, the speakers may not find time to give reply. Okay, the sir. Important purpose of this meeting is giving opportunity to the vice chancellors to interact with the people who are the guests today. Please ascertain all these things accordingly. Ultimately, vice chancellors. Okay, sir. Time okay. To interact with the, each and every one of them. Thank you. Okay, sir. So, as the uh, honourable president has suggested, could we have an interaction with Professor uh, Potavardhan? Uh, may I begin, uh, Mr. President, sir? Hello. Am I audible properly? No, we can't hear yes, you. Yeah. Yeah. Should I stand? Okay, thank you. I yes. can. I can. Hear you. Yes. I would make uh, three or two questions so far as uh, NAC entire accreditation process is concerned. Number one, we have got uniform parameters to all the institutions, whether it's a small college, big college, or any, with a very recently uh, established university or the old university. We'll have to give some weightage to uh, the smaller institutions, smaller colleges like that. And certain parameters, especially in Chhattisgarh where I am is living today, if you have any parameter of having some foreign students, how these colleges have you see uh, foreign students uh, into to their to their you see uh, institution? Thirdly, there are certain rules and regulations of the state governments. I see all colleges have to see abide by those uh, rules and regulations of the uh, of the state governments. So there also will have to give some I see margin as such. And the fourth point which I want to make that's very pertinent about the language. Abhi tak jo kuch bhi ho raha hai, Indostan mein sab samajhiye ki Angrezi, Angrezi, Angrezi mein ho raha hai. Abhari rashti shikcha niti bhi matro bhasha ko matro de rahi hai. To kahin na kahin hume jo regional languages hai, Hindi hai amari, Bangla hai, Marathi hai, Telugu hai, Tamil hai, in sab ko matro dena padega apne snack aggregation mein. Thank you. Uh, very uh, well articulated questions. And uh, actually, these are questions in the minds of many uh, academicians. And uh, I have uh, also realized that there are certain uh, areas which we need to look into it. Uh, I can assure you that all the four questions are valid. And uh, we will look into it. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, please uh, suggest uh, or please send your uh, uh, specific suggestions, you know, to uh, AIU uh, secretary so that she can compile everything uh, and send it to us. This exercise is going to be uh, during next two months. So I would really like uh, you to uh, think about it and send as early as possible. You know, I we are also in a process of writing a white paper. And uh, most of these points which you have raised, you know, uh, will be addressed uh, there. Uh, one thing only I will uh, would like to mention that uh, NAC has already started developing manuals for different specialties. But there are different opinions. 
that uh, if you start uh, developing manuals for each specialty, then there is no end. Everybody will say that I am different, you know. So there is some component which is common. When you say somebody is educated, you know, there are certain expectations in outcomes. So these expectations are very well articulated in national education policy. So that component will be common, whether you are medical education or engineering education, some components of education, you know, to become a good citizen, to understand meaning of life. These are some of the minimum expectation from any educated person. So these will be common. And there will be some uh, other uh, differences based on your discipline or your uh, other characters, you know, will also uh, be coming in. But developing uh, completely independent manuals, then uh, there will be no end. All these, all, all these things are in discussion. Uh, we have realized these uh, issues. And uh, while we uh, are trying to align uh, the entire process to national education uh, policy 2020, issues related to languages, everything, uh, they will be automatically uh, be taken care of, you know. And uh, uh, most importantly, uh, your uh, participation in the process, you know, active participation in the process, vice chancellor's body, you know. I always uh, talk to Professor Mittal, that AIU is the uh, probably only largest uh, association of stakeholders. So AIU say must be considered by the government and government considers that very seriously. And uh, we will certainly welcome all your suggestions and try to do whatever best is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patavadhan. Professor Mittal, can we take the next question, please? Sir, please. Sir, one or two online questions are there. We will just have two, three questions physical, then we'll go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you for presenting about NAC. My name is Shiv Tripathi. I represent... So we, can't, we can't hear. Uh, my name is Shiv Tripathi. I represent Atmiya University Rajkot here. Uh, we discussed about uh, different uh, sustainable development goals and still we are discussing and our NAC quality assurance framework is also being aligned towards that. Uh, just one very quick suggestion or question you may consider it as, when we have thousand universities, unless we mainstream social, economic and environmental dimensions in interrelated manner within organizations, it would be very, very challenging to produce the impact on the outer side community. So just you may consider for incorporating the mainstreaming uh, parameters within the accreditation and assessment framework of universities, including human dignity, social rights, women, gender empowerment, and community economic impact on the different communities. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. I can assure you that this is going to happen. The process already has started. Some of the parameters have been taken, but SDG is going to be, we have two things in front of us, you know, uh, NEP 2020 and SDGs. The whole new uh, uh, process, you know, will revolve around these two. And third important component is our own country. You know? So all, all that, uh, uh, we will uh, try to see that our new uh, uh, methodology and process uh, it does not become only a kind of a structural assessment exercise. But we want to make a shift from structural assessment to functional assessment. You know, our focus will be more on functional. Just by mentioning we are meeting SDGs is not enough. Or just by saying our university deals with critical thinking is not enough. How your students actually are internalizing it and how as outcome measurable outcome, your university is producing your product, those kinds of parameters also will have to be assessed, you know. So uh, from structural to functional shift is not easy, but we will give a best try. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patavardhan. Can we have the next question, please, Professor Mittal? Yes, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Lavira Gupta. I represent lovely professional university in uh, Pagwara. We can't hear. We can't hear. Okay, I'll I'll be a little louder. Please, please. Uh, am I am I clear now? Yes, please. So my suggestion and my point here is that there are 
multiple dots wherein the data is required. The data is of same kind. We are talking about student faculty ratio, student details, but it is pushed to IC, pushed to NBA, pushed to NAC, pushed to, and because all of you are sitting over here, why can't we have a common repository? The data is pushed at one location only and the agencies or accrediting bodies can very well collect the data or seep in the data from there. Because what is happening is the multiplicity of the data is uh, really, really creating quite a lot of, uh, you know, challenges. Uh, so this is my humble suggestion that if we can have common repository of the data, because all the, all the vice chancellors might be facing the similar kind of uh, challenge that it is to be posted there, 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 and same data is to be posted. This is my suggestion. Thanks for the opportunity. No, thank you. Thank you. It's a very good suggestion. And uh, Professor Sastra Budde as well as Professor Agarwal can comment on that. But as I remember, while at UGC, there was a discussion. Even uh, Dr. Pankaj Mikkel also may remember there was a discussion and uh, uh, a kind of a central data uh, how we can create. And we are aware that universities are really uh, spending a lot of time in documentation and Redocumentation, submission, and resubmission, same information, you know. So, this is definitely uh, required. And uh, uh, I think all the regulators separately should discuss how we can bring uniformity uh, and how we can create one pool of data so that universities, uh, in fact, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, you know, today NAC assessment is single point assessment. Uh, and as same is with other assessors also, you know. Can we have a, uh, uh, because of the new technology, and I will talk to Professor Sastra Buddha later, you know, uh, because that is something which is in my mind. Now I can see him on the screen. But with the new technology, Professor Sastra Buddha, uh, with artificial intelligence and uh, uh, big data and uh, also security based systems, including blockchain, uh, it is possible that a uh, lot of data can be captured on real time. So we'll have to really think if that happens, our assessment systems will become even more robust. So, uh, but this is something which will uh, go on uh, uh, in first discussions and then some proof of concept actions. But definitely this uh, uh, kind of a central data repository uh, is required. Your suggestion is well taken. Thank you. I think Professor Puddar has raised his hand. Professor Puddar. Because uh, AICT has already initiated one nation, one data portal. So that portal is already available. I'm sure when Dr. Sahasrabuddha speaks, he'll be speaking a lot about that. But that has already been done. One nation, one data, so that the universities have to key in the data only at one point, not at several points. So we uh, have... Pravita Puttar. Yeah. Namaste, sir. <clears throat> at the very outset, I extend thanks to uh, Professor Patwardhan for his positive way to go for the NAC assessment. And I was just listening, uh, this AIU uh, has given a good chance to, uh, to the stakeholder to participate in such a good, uh, good uh, occasion. And here I have one submission to Patwardhan. Sir, you are talking about quality education and NAC uh, is one of the way where the quality of any institution is assessed. My submission is uh, in, the, in India, there are many universities which is old, there are many which is uh, new, uh, there are central university, there are state university. My submission is a, a university, particularly my university, which is only six years old. And I'm going for the uh, NAC assessment, uh, quality assessment. And uh, uh, in such a situation, when you have a uh, tight way to judge the quality, the standardized form for any university, whether they are a state or the central, whether they are old or the new, uh, under this situation, what kind of way the NAC will adopt to assess the university, which is only the six years old, because of uh, the standard format that you have made. And under this situation, I think the university which is going for the NAC assessment, which is only the six years old, what kind of way the, we should go for preparation so that I can be uh, assessed properly in the national network of quality assessment? Uh, no, you, your question is very good. I would like to have your suggestion. Uh, what do you want or what do you feel or what are your recommendations? 
we want uh, your suggestions also professor podhar you are going to be part of it we are going to resolve it together we want to create a system you know by which no inequality no injustice will be done but at the same time we'll be able to assess where the institution is really delivering quality education that is what is our purpose and uh, uh, whatever changes are necessary uh, we will go on doing it so please feel free to suggest your alternative how to look at the new institutions you know? okay sir Thank professor farooq professor farooq ahmed you have raised your hand mute me sir please unmute me yes professor farooq ahmed I, am i audible sir yes yes thank you very much uh, uh, it's good uh, morning to all of you sir i am uh, professor farooq vice chancellor center university of kashmir Uh, it was nice to be a part of this uh, uh, program. I mean, for, for three days program. Uh, I am sorry I could not be personally there because of some uh, prior engagements over here. Sir, my uh, straight formal question to to uh, Professor uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Parvardhan ji is that uh, since we know that the uh, there has been a lot of emphasis as far as the implementation of NEP 2020 is concerned, and yet every university is trying its hard to to just. see uh, which components can be implemented immediately and which components need further thought and further adjustment of things here and there uh, our university is also of course uh, trying uh, very hard to just see uh, what are the components of nep 2020 which can immediately be uh, this and then make the ground for the implementation of the entire entire uh, this uh, uh, nep uh, my simple uh, question to you sir is since so there are some important areas in nep 2020 uh which are the bedrock of the the success of this policy for example there is multi entry and exit option there is the interdisciplinary approach there is the introduction of apc academy bank of credit then there is a flexibility in the curriculum and embedded curriculum which not only includes the subject matter the core subject matter but also the values the nationalism the sports spirit all these things so my my uh, suggestion is that as far as the seven curricular uh, the seven aspects of parameters of nag accreditation and assessment is concerned right from curriculum aspect to teaching learning and then uh, uh, to the institutional values and best practices can under these present circumstances nag have a revisit at at this 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 uh, parameters seven criteria seven criteria and include somehow some important core elements of nep 20 as an assessment criteria say for example uh, how the university is uh, going ahead with with implementation of multi entry and exit some things like that this is my simple simple suggestion sir simple question sir yeah yeah no thank you professor farooq i made it clear right in the beginning that we are going to align uh, our existing process with nep 2020 to all that what you have said uh, is going to happen some part already has uh, they have happened even without waiting uh, for formal acceptance of nep 2020 also uh, you know there uh, you, you remember there was a, a quality mandate of ugc and there were 10 verticals so many of the parameters based on these 10 verticals you will see that in new manuals already they are covered and the process of adding uh, more parameters or revising existing parameters uh, based on nep 2020 that work also is going on uh, i would really like to uh, suggest professor mittal that uh, i am going to share with you a white paper which we are working on and uh, we would like to have uh, aiu uh, comments on that paper as well you know so i'm sure lot of questions will be addressed uh, uh, through that white paper and lot of uh, 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 our uh, difficulties may also Uh, be able to resolve uh, through this document, uh, so uh, that will save today's time as well. So I would request that uh, you may, uh, from AIU side, collect all the uh, questions uh, or suggestions and uh, respond to that white paper. Uh, uh, you you should get that white paper draft in next uh, week or so. Uh, before that, uh, I am going to send out to you uh, the two sets of questioners. You know. Uh, and this is for uh, sss you know so, uh, stakeholder satisfaction survey it's a very short survey it will not take more than 4 to 5 minutes but i hope that 1000 uh, uh, universities you can send across and uh, 
give us a response from all the vice chancellors and in fact uh, if the uh, vice chancellors can take up responsibility to uh, involve especially the state universities which are having affiliated colleges if those vice chancellors can take uh, responsibility to uh, reach to their principals and get their feedback as well uh, we will be really really grateful to uh, all of you you know because reaching to principals today is very very difficult so it is a very good opportunity for the vice chancellors they can send their suggestions as well as the suggestions of the colleges affiliated to them so a white paper will be circulated to all the vice chancellors through aiu so that oh, you exercise of reimagining uh, uh, assessment and accreditation uh, process so that uh, i don't want to really go on because i can see dr sastrabuddha and dr agarwal on the screen dr sastrabuddha's hand is already up so i would stop session here and uh, give it back to aiu for further uh, thank you thank you professor patavat that but before you leave can i ask a question uh, this oh, is yes. Yes. Uh, now we are thinking that we are hearing that nac is proposing to go in for binary process of accreditation now what is the truth in that because that is uh, that is the international norm that is going on and as you rightly pointed out there is, there is a need to shift from structural to functional assessment and this shift can also be facilitated if we go in for binary accreditation yeah no very good question you know binary accreditation is at present uh, in at the stage of discussion because okay. if you look at nep nep is saying that the first step to go towards binary accreditation is make your existing system robust that is what nep is telling us so first we'll have to really make our system robust and by 2030 that's what the nep is indicating that eventually it will be a binary it may not it may not happen tomorrow so okay thank you professor what about that thank you very much indeed and you, professor das uh, uh, professor yeah. ranjan das i am yeah. going to especially request you is while i will send this uh, white paper to professor mithal for aiu sure uh, i am going to request you individually also to give your comments on that sure paper. sure i sure, will sure. send a mail to you separate sure thank sir you. sure so you know i have a long connection with nac thank you very much for your work what about thanks thank a lot you. thanks a lot thank uh, professor mittal can we now request professor shorshubude yes sir please uh, professor shorshubude yeah thank you very much professor, <laughs> professor suranjan das thank you thank uh, you sir very thank exciting, you uh, listening to both you know uh, professor uh, patwardhan on one side and many other queries asked by many people and which creates a lot of enthusiasm in understanding both new national education policy which has come in being as well as the sustainability and sustainable development goals now colonel uh, thiruvasagam who is the president of aiu madam pankaj mithal professor das yourself bhushan patwardhan professor agarwal all vice chancellors i think i am very pleased to be here i wanted to be physically present in mysore i had committed but because of last moment changes i was not able to come there but physically nahi hai to digitally i am available you <laughs> know that's what has happened uh, the various aspects of new education policy are being discussed in the last one and a half years i think many of them are now clear about what it all talks about but still there are doubts even in the minds of vice chancellors and that's why uh, the conferences of this nature are very important in order to discuss this threadbare and start implementing one of the most important thing which i notice in the new education policy is how the entire business of education can become very smooth that is what uh, in the commercial aspects we'd say ease of doing business has to be also there in education and that's why one of the uh, you know vice chancellors when he asked the data being asked by multiple agencies that's where i had raised the hand and uh, professor patwardhan was also saying that uh, professor agarwal and professor sarsu they are doing something about it so we have been on this job for the last 5 years fortunately now we are coming to the success uh, we had to convince ministry which uh, conducts this aisha survey annually and then uh, whether it is aict or ugc collects information from all the institutions annually there are other organizations also collect annually and uh, i have noted that for a 
ordinary college or a university in some state, they have to give data eight times in a year for different agencies and 80 to 90 percent of the data is common. Then why should each one of them give each time different places, same keying in of the data? And that is where the mistakes start occurring. If you have to give data only once, the university or the college will take care meticulously so that the data is accurate. But now when multiple people in the college or university are asked to fill in this data, depending on their understanding, they will fill the data and there will be inconsistencies. And then we start blaming that university is trying to fake the data. I think we need to create a infrastructure wherein the data is collected only once. And we have already had a RFP. We are selecting an agency to create a portal where one nation, one data concept is going to be there. It is also going to be there for study in India program also. So there are many universities who take in foreign students. Each one of them, why should they be keeping on asking uh, to fill the data at different places? Ministry of Culture has its own program. So the whole process of what government is trying to do is ease of doing business in terms of whether it is regulatory business. And that's why merger of AICT, UGC, NCT and all those agencies into HECI is also one of those agendas which is there in the new national education policy. It may take some time to create an act and then do it. But nevertheless, the policy is very clear about making the whole process as easy as possible for all stakeholders, be it students, be it faculty, be it the vice chancellors or universities or for that matter, the other part from outside that is industry where they come in for doing their, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving jobs to our students or giving internships. So everything has to be made as easy as possible is the approach which this particular policy is talking about. And therefore, our multiple entry, multiple exit, academic bank of credits, giving importance to our Indian knowledge systems, giving importance to innovation, giving importance to wherever possible in the form of education being imparted digitally in terms of online education or ODL education, whereby we create more gross enrollment ratio, much easier, how we can start sharing of our resources. Earlier, otherwise, we always used to say that each institution must have independent building, land, playground, everything, how we can also share some of our resources, thereby cut the cost on education, cut the cost on overheads, how the universities can become larger, you know, colleges also can graduate to become universities, to become degree awarding institutions. I think all of these are there and various nuances of this are being worked out by various committees. And many of these things are now coming out in the form of regulations. There are regulations which have come out from AICT, some regulations from UGC. I hope uh, if we all read them carefully, we understand how empowering the new education policy has been. And therefore, whether it is in terms of employability, whether it is in terms of creating entrepreneurial ecosystem, whether it is in terms of internationalization, getting foreign universities in India or Indian universities going abroad or programs which are not just winning, but dual degree or double degree, all of that are in the pipeline. Some of them have come in, some of them are on the portal to give the inputs and some others are in the phase of actually formulating the gazette notifications themselves. Therefore, in almost all the cases, except some of those tall things like reaching the gross enrollment ratio to 50% or all the uh, affiliated colleges becoming autonomous and then finally degree awarding institutions, that cannot be possible overnight. And just like, uh, you know, uh, our Professor Bhushan was also telling that even though it is only uh, yes or no type of uh, accreditation, uh, there is no scoring which is going to be involved. That all will take some time. You know, some of these things will take five years, some of them will take 10 or even 15 years. But many of the activities that are pronounced in the new education policy are al already being rolled out. Some of them are already being implemented. And so in the first two years itself, many of these things are happening. The next part of this, uh, which is also connected, is also about sustainable development goals. When one of the goals is also about education, and that's why uh, how we connect SDGs with the education sector. And not just the education goal of the SDG, but all other goals, 17 goals, are some way or the other related with education. Whether it is taking care of environment, our planet has to survive. You know, there are also some of the watchdogs who say that 
the life of this planet if we do not change the track in seven years will be irreversible you know in thermodynamics we call reversible reactions and irreversible so if we are reaching irreversibility in seven years then i think we are done this is the only planet right now for survival and living and we should not go to that state and that's why one more thing which we have been advocating is net zero not zero uh, zero right now is no no good we need to become net zero and our prime minister also has given commitment that by 2070 we will have fully net zero and that's why all of these concerns in terms of our indian knowledge systems with uh, the kind of knowledge that we had in terms of environment i think especially environment in terms of healthcare the covid has shown us that a lot of stress is generated by yoga meditation how can we control ourselves i think these are all very valuable things which should become part of the education system and for anyone wherever some student is there if that student wants to learn something new different from what is not existing in his college or university the swayam portal was already there but it is being expanded to include even other portals similar to swayam from not just our nation but outside also that also is being talked about so that means uh, what we have started doing under national educational alliance for technology in terms of getting such kind of uh, ai based products which uh, students can buy pro procure and then make use of them in terms of employability but gradually some of them may become part of the curriculum in terms of one credit course or two credit courses which is a possibility in the near future uh, however there are always uh, challenges when there are transformations happening there will be certainly some uh, turbulence and we need to understand in fluid mechanics to make it laminar flow it will take some time and that is the phase in which we are going through uh, i want to stop at this because uh, the time is very short i have just crisply given on just about 7 8 minutes my thoughts on not only new education policy and sustainability if there are any questions i am available for the next 5 6 minutes thank you very much thank you professor uh, shorshubude for setting the ball rolling for i am sure for what would be a very effective uh, interactive session professor mittal can we then take the questions yes sir dr p b sharma wants to ask one question sir dr p b sharma and anybody else you can raise your hand so that the mics can go to you volunteers please give the mics to the hands of the people the past president of aiu current we can't hear can you be little loud please i really have no question other than to say that the aiu had set up a committee for accreditation and ranking under my chairmanship and we have conducted highly meaningful satisfaction survey and opinion survey of vice chancellors of india and the report which we have submitted to ai contains certain meaningful recommendations my only prayers to honorable patwardhan ji and also to dr k k agrawal sahab would be to pay some attention to this report now that the new world is been the making the landscape of higher education is deeply changing we cannot be fitting one size to all universities also and we need to pay a greater greater attention to the cause of employability the cause of integrity the cause of credibility of the university and also the quality and eminence of the faculty that we nurture in our university campuses and we also need to now understand that tomorrow's higher education is not per se data driven it will be driven by the calls for integrity credibility and the relevance for which we all exist and therefore i think in my opinion major reforms are required both at the level of nec as well as nirf and i'm sure with professor patwardhan going from ugc to nec as our honorable chairman such major reform would be in the offing and same is the case with nba also and also the national ranking authority headed by professor k k agrawal i have all my hopes that we would be echoing the sentiments of our vice chancellors contained in this report whereby we have overscored the importance of integrity credibility faculty eminence and the relevance of higher education to make our mother india smile and be proud of the universities of india thank you so much 
uh, Professor Arvind has a question. Professor Arvind. Yeah, so this is Professor Arvind, Vice Chancellor of Punjabi University, Patiala. Mm, I want to make just three quick remarks. Uh, I think the fact that uh, new education policy has uh, brought to us that Indian higher education system needs a makeover is very important. And the kind of flexibility that is being talked about, uh, many of us are fi may find it difficult to implement, but I think it is need of the hour and we must... Uh, revamp our system to adapt this flexibility, which is a very important thing. The other thing I want to say is that the horizontal and vertical connectivity of higher education is something, again, uh, which to some extent policy talks about. Higher education institutions must interact all the way on the one hand with primary schools and horizontally across the globe. So uh, this also is partly there, but part maybe we should develop this further. Uh, and as was mentioned, that uh, some aspects of having all colleges autonomous and everyone giving their own degrees uh, is something that which is going to take much more time. And I think we also should not hurry in that direction because uh, immediately uh, we have to also maintain educational standards. So on the whole, I think the discussion is going on in a very healthy way. And uh, hopefully we will be able to together give a makeover to um, Indian higher education system. Thank you. Professor Shashabad, would you like to respond? Yeah, I think, thank you, Arvind ji. Uh, basically, there are no questions by either Professor Sharma or these are all complimentary things which they have said. So, thank you very much. But I just want to reiterate three yeah, yeah. things. Uh, there we... are some questions. Uh, please just wait. Uh, please. I will gather three more questions and then you Absolutely. can respond. Yeah, please, please. Why do you, why do you contact it? Teresa University? So there are some hands raised in the audience. I'll just invite them and then. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. So uh, we, can't, we can't hear you, madam. We can't hear you. Put the mic closer to you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm uh, Dr. Vaidehi from Mother Teresa Women's University, Kodekanal, Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu has got uh, lots of reservation in adapting NEP policy. And as far as women university is concerned, we feel that when we have an exit option, the students leaving the course, instead of studying for three years, they may leave in first year or second year or third year. And uh, how this can be prevented or this, how this can be taken care? That is what is very important uh, as far as our university is concerned. Thank you very much. And sir, we'll take all the questions. Either though, please. Good morning, on the dais and off the dais. I am Professor B.P. Veerabhadrappa from Coimbatore University, Vice Chancellor Coimbatore University, Karnataka. Long back, uh, Dr. Montek Singh Haluwali has said that there should be higher education accessible to all the people. When Professor Sahasrabuddhi was talking about, I was really impressed. But there are certain, certain serious uh, issues that are very much before us as to how do we be able to have the entry and also exit. And how do we be go, able to go for the open uh, electives. Number three, most important as to how do we be able to find that there are certain critical issues that can accommodate all the students into the mainstream of higher education. I think Professor Patwardhan was talking about as to what NAC guidelines are talking about, but as to how do you really find that universities are working for NAC guidelines, maybe C or B plus, B double plus, A plus, A double plus, and all that. I think this is this is a one aspect that all the university vice chancellors are uh, intending that there should be there should be a war on the targets that are being fixed by NAC as what. Uh, Professor Bajpay was talking about as to how regional issues are very, very important. And how do we be able to take those regional issues and what uh, Professor uh, 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 President of AAU was talking about as to how regional issues are very important and how autonomy for universities are very much important. I think these are some of the issues that I wanted to make a present. Thank you very much. Just give it here. Here, please. 
Thank you very much. I'm Professor Upadhyay from uh, Charatar University of Science and Technology, Changa, Gujarat. I did uh, appreciate the NEP policies, but what I find is that still we are keeping no space for those students who are accelerated studies they would like to do. We have fixed the number of years even now, 3 plus 2, or it has made to 3 plus 1 plus 1 for postgraduate. Where is this room for those who are intelligent enough, those who want to complete their studies within three years and would like to do something? And I think this is one of the things which is missing in the NEP policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we'll request Professor Sah Dr. Adian Javachavi. Sir, very quick question because time is short. And Dr. Surappa, these two only. We'll yeah. take one, Dr. Adian Bajpayee and Dr. Surappa. Yeah, this is a question to the Dr. Sahasrabudhi. Uh, you know, this uh, educational policies, 86, 96, all now coming to the NEP 2022. You know, one, one policy to another policy moved on. Did uh, any of the regulatory bodies or the government made an assessment of what are the success and the failures and what was to be done? Has, have we been able to document any such things? Now we are bringing NEP 2020, which is a drastically different. It requires a big change in the economic setup, uh, financial resources. At the same time, in the state universities are coming under the grip of the state university, state governments where they are not able to play much role, then what kind of a things that your, your bodies have been able to make the changes that is required to be these policies to be successful? You know, after five years, will we again take a review of the, what is happening to the NEP, come out with a new policy? I think this is a need to be done, addressed very carefully, Professor Bhutti. I think, you know, this is where I think we need to learn from the lessons, you know, what were our failures and what were our objectives? But just producing a graduate, are just producing the you know unicorns you know what they are doing it now are they solving the employment problems i think these are the things i think we need to study a regulatory body like act and all needs to be done in a greater depth i think this is where i think we need to ask the questions okay that's why i'm asking question dr sasabudhi thank you last question by dr adian bajpai then we'll request him first. Uh, my very uh, simple question is that we are always talking under the ages of national education policy. Hello, please be a little loud. We can't hear. Hello, sir. Yes. I think I am audible. Yes, please. Yes, sir. I was just uh, saying that we are discussing everything under the ages of national education policy in which there is no role for silos. We want to make entire educational system you see, an integrated and holistic one, which Honorable Vice President of India was also mentioning in his inaugural address today. So AICT, just to see keeping for science and technology education only, I think, won't serve the purpose for the nation as a whole, which P.P. Sharma also reiterated where. How AICT is going to include our subjects like philosophy or that, those of social sciences or is it humanities. I think now the role of AICT should not only confine to only science and technology and tidbits, but it will have to expand its role for the nation as a whole, for the cultural recourse, cultural values, those things shall have to take into consideration. That's my humble submission. Thank you, Sasmadev. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mittal, can I please ask a question before Professor Shashubhudeh responds? Sure, sir. You have it. Uh, uh, Professor Shashubhudeh, once again, thank you very much uh, for your submission. And I would like to put on record uh, the excellent way in which you are giving leadership uh, to the AICT. In fact, you are one of the few chairpersons who responds to each and every email instantly you get. You send an email at 12 o'clock in the night and you get the response at 6 o'clock in the morning. So this is amazing. Thank you very much indeed. So one thing sir, I would like to uh, make a suggestion. Under your leadership, AICT has strengthened the university industry partnership program. And you have initiated a large number of schemes. For example, you have correctly laid emphasis on the internships of the students. Now, very often what happens, there is a clash between the academic calendar and the internship that the student gets. Can we think of devising a mechanism whereby there could be a transfer of credits for the students going in for interns so that they do not uh, uh, get a disadvantageous position in terms of getting academic credit? That was my suggestion, sir. Uh, thank you. I think uh, the questions will keep coming, so I will now stop the questions. I will start answering. Uh, starting from the last one, uh, Professor Suranjan Das, we have already said that for internship, we can give credits. 
Okay. Okay. Not only that, we have also indicated that there must be some activity points that the students must undertake, and for that also we can give credits. All right. So sir. credits is not necessarily only for the classes they attend or the tutorials or the experiments mm -hmm. they do, but what they learn even outside the premises of the institution. Wherever they can be evaluated, there can be credits which are going to be awarded. So this is okay, number sir. one. Okay. To support internship, we have created an internship portal, and yeah. it's not meant for only technical college students. It is also available and open for liberal arts, commerce, science, any particular higher education student. There are internship opportunities for such students as well. I think the universities must make this website of ours popular. Although it is under AICT's name, it has content which is required for all variety of domain of knowledge. And today we talk about multidisciplinary education, and that's why people from engineering background are also allowed to take courses in humanities and social yeah. sciences. Professor Vajpayee was asking this question that we have already made the curriculum such flexible that students can take, uh, along with maybe physics, a course on uh, psychology along with a course in mathematics, a course in music, this is all allowed. But of course, you cannot take only courses on music and ask to give a degree in mechanical engineering. That is not possible. There are certain number of credits up to which one can do take. I think that is the second part of it. And then uh, Dr. Sharma ji was rightly saying that importance of values. Ultimately, each one of us are talking about what is the outcome that we want to achieve out of the higher education. In fact, education itself. It is good human beings, good citizens are to be created. Automatically, they become employable, they become entrepreneurial, they will serve the society, they become the leaders. And therefore, the common universal human values course which we have developed and the training <coughs> given constantly to faculty members for student induction program and universal human values by AICT. More than nearly one lakh faculty are trained in the last three years. And I'm very thankful to all these volunteers who don't take a single penny as honorarium, but week after week, full week program they are being running. And it was initially for only technical institutions, but many university vice chancellors have adopted it. I'm very thankful to all the vice chancellors who have adopted. Others also may watch this. They may train themselves first and their faculty members and subsequently take it down to the students level. As far as multiple entry exit is concerned, there are challenges. I will agree to that, that it's not easy, well said, but uh, while implementing. But we have created a robust mechanism. Our approval process handbook, which is going to out in about a couple of days time, has shown a clear diagram as to what we will be able to do. The policy also talks about <laughs> educational education, skill education, and general education, so oh, that no. movement from oh. one to the other should be yeah. easy. It should not be difficult. Today, it's not so easy. A student who has done an ITI wants to come into <laughs> diploma or engineering. It is not so easy. We had a committee where 14 subjects we had identified for entry into engineering itself. And there was a hue and cry. So I think there are possibilities of making entry exit easily possible. But suitable bridge courses will be required at both the ends. While you enter with a different type of a, a qualification, naturally, in order to become level with the rest of the students, you need to do certain bridge courses. That means all prerequisites to understand the courses which are going to follow have to be clearly done by the student. This is very, very important. Similarly, if someone exits at the end of one year or two year with a certificate or a diploma, there will be no market for him to get a job unless certain extra courses are given to him, make him slightly expert in certain domain and if you give a certificate, he becomes employable. And therefore, large number of possible bridge courses, both at entry and exit, have to be done. We are only giving sample, but each university is, is autonomous. They can develop their own and then allow this to happen. And the fear that how can some student leave at some, somewhere in between and, and then come back some other time, what will happen? Please take it for granted that this number is going to be very, very minimal. It will not even be 2-3%. Because anyone who joins a particular program, they want to complete that program. They want to complete the degree. Now, who are the ones who will either quit and go in between? The ones who have some real financial difficulty at the family level and therefore they cannot continue their education, they may want to leave. 
there may be cases where a student was not at all interested his parents had thrust him into this education he is not doing well he wants to go out otherwise i don't think anyone who has taken with a due diligence a course of medicine will continue in medicine one who has done in engineering will continue and so on so i think we should not have too much of a fear about entry exit large numbers will not happen but nevertheless if someone has such difficulty today the university uh, you know our uh, rules regulations both from university side aict ugc were not permitting today we are opening an window of opportunity to such candidates who have real such difficulties the lastly uh, there was a talk about uh, indian languages the ethos the states and all of that some states not allowing i think the policy is so liberal and so open there is nothing to be opposed to be but still if someone says that we don't want to whatever they are doing is in fact part of the new education policy whether they agree it or not secondly in terms of indian languages being provided for in the higher education we started last year itself and i am very happy that in six languages in 10 states 20 colleges adopted teaching of engineering in uh, indian languages and these languages start from the hindi tamil telugu kannada marathi bengali and thereafter just now we started receiving that odia gujarati and also punjabi they also want to give education in these languages we have created an artificial intelligence based translation tool we have translated courses of swayam in the first year all of them into eight languages and we are increasing it to 12 languages we have also got the books written and the books which are available translated by using ai translation tool which makes our job easier 80 to 90% of the work is done by the tool remaining 10 20% finishing touches are to be given by the experts who know the language and who know the subject i think this is empowering and which we have already done lastly please also participate in becoming innovation movement leaders actually because universities are the places where innovation to take place and uh, mhrd means now ministry of education's innovation cell is located we conduct smart india hackathons we have innovation councils established in different institutions the innovation need not come only from technical institution it can come from an arts college it can come from a science college it can come from a commerce college my appeal to you is be part of this whole movement whereby we create a new india which is going to be a very very powerful nation but which is very very soft nation which will take care of the whole world with our philosophy of vasudeva kutumbakam and sarve janaha sukhino bhavantu namaste thank you very much for the sarsu bande i can assure you the iu will be a definitely a part of the new movement that you are speaking about thank you professor sarsu bande uh, professor mittal can we then request professor uh, k k agarwal yes sir please uh, professor agarwal yeah yeah uh, namaskar uh it is indeed my very personal pleasure and privilege to invite professor agarwal to share his valuable thoughts on the problematic that has been chosen for discussion professor agarwal under it is under your effective stewardship that the national ranking framework is being organized and it is again under your pioneering leadership that the process of accreditation of engineering institutions technical institutions are being successfully organized we do look forward professor agarwal to hearing from you and i'm sure it will again introduce new entry points for deliberation professor agarwal please thank you so much thank you so much uh, professor uh, das and uh, dr mittal for uh, chairing this session i hope i am audible Clear? yes sir yes sir uh, let me first of all thank uh, uh, president aiu dr thubsgang and uh, secretary general dr pankaj mittal for giving me this opportunity to be a part of uh, to be part of this uh, great session to talk to the distinguished vice chancellors of this country on the most important topic on uh, accreditation <coughs> dear colleagues uh, i have heard uh, professor patwardhan and professor uh, anil sahasrabuddhe <clears throat> and i it appears to me that uh, uh, each one of us 
will say the same thing, is saying the same thing and going ahead on the same path. In a way, it's a very good uh, uh, symptom. And uh, whatever vice chancellors could ask questions and intervene, uh, I definitely feel uh, all of us in the country are together on the basic need, as Professor Sasrabuddha said, to join the movement for uh, changing education. Unfortunately, academic world has been somehow become least uh, open to changes, had become most conservative. And uh, I mean, uh, I, I was many a time surprised when we wanted industry to tell us what to teach. And uh, there, there was a time uh, uh, four decades ago where industry used to ask the universities, what should we try to plan? And things like that. Meaning thereby that the universities were always fast thinkers, were always supposed to lead the nation and the world. Uh, but somehow with the passage of time for uh, a few decades, it became uh, more or more uh, structured and overstructured, I would say, and thereby creativity and innovation taking a back seat. Friends, my topic of discussion, which has been assigned today, is uh, on National Board of Accreditation, Chairman, and uh, uh, ranking a little bit. National Board of Accreditation, as you are all aware, is primarily for the accreditation of uh, uh, programs which are in the domain of AICTE. That is, we deal with engineering, architecture, pharmacy, management, fine arts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for the time being, at least, we are not venturing into any other uh, programs. What happens after NSE comes in and things like that has yet to be seen. And the second, uh, this, the distinguishing feature from uh, NAC, which again, all the honorable vice chancellors know, uh, NBA always goes in for program-wise accreditation. We do not go into the institution as a whole. Of course, in some situations where we wanted institutional accreditation also to be quantified, we, we and AICT uh, jointly worked on and made some uh, uh, guidelines like this that if more than half the programs in an institution are accredited, we can take that institution as accredited from for the point of view of autonomy and all that. Uh, having said that, program-wise accreditation is our, uh, our domain of working and we intend continuing with that for the time being at least, because word over, at least all the uh, regulated programs are on program-wise accreditation. And I personally believe as we go more and more interdisciplinary, uh, the time and maturity of each program will be different. And tomorrow, if IITs start medical colleges, law colleges, for them to become as good in quality as their technical education is, uh, will take time. And therefore, if we go into the statistical average of all programs, it may not be very, very uh, desirable. Therefore, program-wise accreditation may continue to stay for some time at least in the uh, programs which are of specialized nature. Uh, in the national education policy, it has been clearly said that the new norm of accreditation will be, new norm of regulation will be accreditation. Meaning thereby that gradually accreditation will be mandatory. Now that uh, gradual process will take uh, five years, seven years, 10 years, 15 years, nobody knows. But ultimately the spirit is uh, you ought to be accredited for an institution to stay or you may not be able to stay for long if you're not accredited. Uh, the reason is very simple because uh, Accreditation is a process which is normally carried out after a few years of existence of an institution. By then, we definitely expect the institutions to have recruited the faculty, to have set up the labs, to set up their systems, to set up their research ecosystem, to set up their consultancy ecosystems, placement scenario, and so on and so forth. And therefore, accreditation process is in a better position to measure the metrics uh, than at the very initial stages when UGC or AICT grant the approval, because that is mostly on the green field and you have to go by promises rather than actual deliverables. Third thing which I would like to point out is, NBA is a member of the Washington Accord. 
And in the Washington Accord, we have a very nice uh, lesson to learn. And that lesson is, which has now come in national policy of education, that's outcome-based education. NBA was going in for outcome-based education right from day one, uh, primarily mandated by Washington Accord, where we do really do not say that, uh, say a degree in electrical engineering must have three courses in mathematics, two in physics, two in chemistry. We don't say anything like that. Uh, we only say an engineer must have these 12 graduate attributes. Now, we, the whole process is built that way, that an engineer must have these 12 graduate attributes. And to achieve these 12 graduate attributes, how do we work? Uh, we leave it to you. It may be different for different institutions. It may depend on the strength of the institution, may depend upon the local conditions, so on and so forth. But how do you achieve that is an open question. And that's the whole philosophy of uh, outcome-based education. As long as outcomes are achieved, uh, this is fine. And I think one of our uh, colleague, uh, Vardhi Vice Chancellor, was raising this. Uh, uh, how do we go ahead with that? And we are doing it for last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, let me hasten to add, if you say that the system is perfected, no, please. As chairman NBA, I am uh, a forthright admitting we have much more to do to really translate outcome-based education into ground level reality. Our system is still a a mixed kind of system where we do take care of outcomes as well as uh, inputs to some extent. But gradually, the philosophy is to go to outcome-based education. And Washington Accord uh, mandated for all the 21 countries which are at the, mem at the present members of the Washington Accord. When India became the member, we were uh, 15th in the row. Now there are 21 members of the Washington Accord. And all these 21 members have the same list of 12 graduate attributes for engineering education. In addition, you can add some program specific objectives, but basically this remains. So that gives us an advantage to have a level playing field with these 21 countries, which include Australia, New Zealand, UK, USA, um, et cetera, et cetera, Malaysia, Indonesia, everything, Singapore. So the, these 21 countries graduate from an accredited institution is placed at par of the graduate of an accredited institution from India that gives a lot of confidence to the student and to us that our uh, uh, real thrust on outcome-based education is uh, <laughs> Having said that, I would uh, use this forum to request the vice chancellors, uh, let's not focus on accreditation, let us focus on outcome-based education. Once the education is improved, accreditation will have to be given to you. It's nobody's case that uh, how accreditation can be given. Once the teaching learning process is taken care of, when the research deliverables are taken care of, faculty quality is taken care of, accreditation metrics are automatically satisfied and that will have to be incorporated. I thank AIU for uh, giving focus on uh, this in a particular session. And uh, let me again say that the focus chosen for this vice chancellor's conference on sustainability development goals is really, really great. And I compliment the president and the secretary general and all the um, standing committee members of the AIU to have chosen this topic. Because this is a topic which was there in the uh, list of books Several years ago in 2015, the formerly the countries of the world prepared a list of 17 sustainability development goals, but we have done precious little uh, in these years. And uh, handling of COVID is one thing which tells us that our sustainability development goals had not reached even midpoint. Had it been there, probably suffering because of COVID would have been far too less. Not that the COVID would not have been there, but the effects would have been uh, much less if we would have uh, uh, done that. So therefore, sustainability development goals focus is a must. We have to do that. And uh, the regional, the, all the four regional conferences of AIU focused on uh, a few sustainability development goals. And in this annual session, it's a compilation of all 17. Uh, Kindly allow me to make a statement that uh, education as one sustainability goal is, the, is not the only one our concern. Our concern as vice chancellors is 
all the 17 sustainability goals, uh, clean energy, can it be without education, uh, eliminating hunger, can it be without education, uh, solar energy, uh, energy efficiency, education, minimum standard of living, sustainable, develop, sustainable cities, sustainable towns, nothing can be done without education. So I think it will be a very, very limited uh, view if we think education as one of the sustainability development goals is our main concern, yes, but other 16 are, I think, equally important concerns. And I'm happy that you are taking all 17. Washington Accord, we have a meeting every year. And in this year's meeting, uh, first of all, I would like to share the news with you. Of course, it's a little old news that uh, Washington Accord is reviewed every six years. And NBA's membership, the Washington Accord, was renewed in the last meeting. And uh, the system is that you must have uh, uh, two third member countries voting for your robust system. And I'm so happy to share with my colleague vice chancellors. I think maybe rarely in the history of uh, Washington Accord, all the other 20 countries supported India's robust system and unanimously voted for India to continue its membership of the Washington Accord uh, because of our uh, systems. Uh, having said that, it might sometimes appear to some people that we are little uh, stringent. But to keep in view the sanctity of Washington Accord, we have to keep international standards. And also in the last meeting of the Washington Accord, we did say that sustainability is what is India's suggestion, that sustainability should now become one of the graduate attributes. And there have been some webinars on this. And finally, now Washington Accord is very serious considering that can they make sustainability as one of the recognized uh, graduate attributes of all engineers. Uh, once it is done there, uh, probably it will be a little easier for us in the country to take it to all domains of education. Because personally, I believe sustainability will be a parameter for all kinds of education and all levels of education. Uh, having said that, friendly uh, friends, I always uh, uh, believe Sometimes what appears apparent uh, may not be uh, the real truth. And therefore to design matrix, to measure all these things is always a challenge. And we are always open to keep on revising the matrix to the extent we can, because it's a dynamic curriculum. What appears visible uh, may not be always the right uh, uh, most uh, metric. So how do we change the meeting? How do we make the system more and more uh, uh, dynamic? And finally, uh, Professor Sarabhati already clarified and uh, to the query for Dr. Saranjan Das, I think that uh, problem has to be resolved because I sometimes feel very guilty that our university faculties are uh, busy in collecting data. And uh, pardon me saying, at, the, at times at the cost of taking a class or guiding research. I think we have to be doing something jointly, very serious on this, because I would uh, never prefer accreditation over teaching or research. Uh, with these initial remarks, I'm open to any uh, queries, if I can be of any assistance to the Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, uh, Professor Agrawal, for that very exciting and uh, excellent presentation, sir. Uh, uh, the floor is now open for discussion, Professor Mittal. Yes, sir. Any questions from the floor? Professor Ved Kumari? Good, good morning and good afternoon. Am I audible to you? Yes, yes, madam. Okay. I have a question for Professor Sahasrabuddha. He invited us to look at the uh, website and I was looking at the one data, one nation, one data. Uh, uh, he said that is almost ready. And what I see, if I, if I, no, I would need uh, some guidance on this one, what I could see is, was that in January and February, we have uh, floated a tender for asking for parties to apply for creating that. So my sense is that we are not really ready with the, 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 the portal very in the, in the very near future. 
So, uh, and I did hear uh, him say that uh, for the last five years, we've been working on it. So I was just wanting to know that what is the status of, because we are, I think as Vice Chancellors, finally raised this issue that uh, supplying data on multiple forums has been very problematic. So what is the status there really? I think Dr. Sahasrabuddha has left. I, I am not very sure. Vijinda, Dr. Sahasrabuddha is there. But I, I think he said that in a couple of days it will be there. No, what I can, I do not know because the website of AICT where he asked us to look at, visit that, I was looking at, you know, what are the possible options for us to use that website. And I found that the tender has been floated in January, then revised in February. Tender asking for people to apply to create the portal. So I do not know whether the portal is not updated or whether, uh, where is the gap in the information. So Dr. Sahasrabuddha has left, so we'll target that question to him and come back to you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Sunil Rai, UPS Vice Chancellor. This question is to uh, Dr. K.K. Agarwal, sir. Uh, since I also was fortunate to serve as the General Counsel of NBA for about five years, uh, basically there is a, a feeling that uh, accreditations are mostly for STEM-related uh, programs. I just wanted to understand from Dr. Agarwal, sir, as to what is the thought for now that NEP is a reality, we are talking about uh, non-STEM uh, programs, which we want that these programs also should be regarded as well as the other ones. So for liberal studies, uh, fine arts and others, is there any thought uh, for accrediting such programs which are not under the direct ambit of uh, One, okay, please. To select the questions? This is just a related question. Uh, so just to reflect on you, what you said, it's no more STEM, it is teams, science, technology, engineering, arts, and man. All the uh, question uh, to be answered by Dr. Agarwal. That is what he asked, that why STEM is not STEAM. <laughs> so Professor Agarwal, please. Yeah, uh, I, I I appreciate the question which has been asked by Dr. Sunil Rai and uh, uh, complimented by others. Uh, well, I, I think at the moment NPA accredits only programs which are in engineering, management, pharmacy, architecture, etc. But what will happen tomorrow after we get uh, Hackey Bill and then NAC is one of the four verticals and uh, under the NAC, NAC will be there, NBA there, plus plus XVZ, maybe anything. So then how do we define the role of each of the accrediting agencies will have to be seen. But nonetheless, STEM is important and now our job say for example if we have to accredit a mechanical engineering degree it will be for us to see has the mechanical engineering degree enough inputs of uh, other disciplines also to make it a more balanced mechanical engineer so the challenge will be uh, somebody will have to accredit mechanical engineering as mechanical engineer civil engineering as civil engineering as professor sasrabuddha was also saying flexibility will not mean any 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 subjects anywhere it will have to be a judicious mix somewhere and uh, focus on interdisciplinary education, which is exemplified by STEM as modified as STEAM, will be when we accredit a mechanical engineering program, we will also gradually have to see whether it's enough broad-based mechanical engineering as envisaged by NEP or a uh, very traditional mechanical engineering. But uh, the focus on the, see, we are trying to uh, stop the bifurcations at the school level. For example, plus two, 
ultimately, maybe after 10 years, may not be a science team, PCM, PCB, et cetera, et cetera. But we still continue to live with engineering degrees. Now, if I have to give somebody a degree of civil engineering, uh, he cannot study any 40 courses or not and claim to be a civil engineer. So some, somewhere we will have to define what has to be done, how much component can be interdisciplinary, how much component can be multidisciplinary. There may be a lot of flexibility, but within the boundary conditions. And therefore, job of accreditors will also be little more flexible, uh, but little more challenging. But nonetheless, it will have to be defined that way. So I, I don't see any major change happening, except the change of mindset, change of rubrics, for example, uh, in the coming years, we may not be required to be very stringent about the headcount of teachers in mechanical engineering. Because a lot of students of mechanical engineering might opt to study courses outside. So why will you have teachers in mechanical engineering if they opt to study courses outside? So these will be some challenges which will come in and which will have to be adapted to the system. Short of that, I believe uh, the basic philosophy would remain. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there any other question? We can go ahead with ICAR. Yeah, can I, but uh, before that, can I raise a question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Most welcome. Sir, sir, well, sir uh, one question here also. From, but, uh, Professor uh, Mittal doesn't want me to ask the question. That's why he's right. shifting. Sure, Professor Mittal, can, can I have your permission to ask the question? Sure, sure, sir. Sure. Sure. Madam, can I <laughs> sir, uh, uh, you have rightly laid out the new parameters for accreditation. Uh, you also indicated that you could show, shed some light on the NIRF ranking, which you are also spearheading. Sir, I had one uh, question, sir. Now, in the NIRF ranking procedure, there are parameters which can be verified without visits to the institutions. And there are parameters which can be verified without visiting the institutions. Now, can we envisage a system where different weightages can be given to these two sets of parameters? Otherwise, you know, sometimes it creates a lot of confusion. That was my suggestion, sir. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Dr. Das. Uh, parameters are many and weightages are already different, but probably you are suggesting is that weightages may have to be relocated. That's and sir. some weightages sir. might have to be increased, some sir. weightages might have yes, to be sir. decreased. And yes, your, your point is uh, importance of the parameter is one thing, but its measurability is another thing. Sure, sir. Sure, so let's, sir. Uh, assign the weightage depending upon importance as well as uh, sure. measurability. Sure, sir. I, I, I see your point and we look into it. And I will also request AIU at some forum, at some point of time, maybe a round table of vice chancellors or something, which can sure. tell us what sure. should be done. Thank you. Thank because you. Because this Thank is our you. own system. We can change any time. Yeah. Nobody has forced the system on us. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, I have received some comments only about perception. And because in international rankings, perception goes up to the 50% level, we kept perception only 10%. Sure. Because we did not want to keep it zero, because ultimately institutions have to go in for international ranking also. And yeah. out of these 10, also we have tried to quantify, for example, if your NAC accredited 30% weightage is already there and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, I think I see your point because it is neither physical nor practical to yeah. visit the institution. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. more weightage to more correctly measurable parameters sure, may sure. be built into. We'll be sure. open to this, but sure. I and the ranking society may not be uh, sufficiently adequate. So I sure. believe a good representative group of vice chancellors sure. uh, may not pick up all amongst the top few uh, sure. mixed uh, wide spectrum group of vice chancellors sure. sure. can debate on it and sure. give us the parameters. We'll be open sure. to this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Indian Mr. Agarwal. Professor Agarwal, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Mittal, you now have a new challenge of organizing a roundtable. Professor Mittal. Hello. Yes. Professor Mittal, yes, you sir. now have a new challenge of organizing a roundtable. Yes, sir. We'll do it. No issues at all. <laughs> sir, just okay. one question from the Vice Chancellor of LPU, and then we'll move on to Dr. R. C. Agrawal. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Dr. K. K. Agrawal Sahab. Uh, 
uh, I, as Matt very rightly said, I represent lovely professional university. So when FYUG, the ideologies and doctrines of FYUG are coming into picture, the multiple entry, multiple exit, the philosophy is now, now coming up. Don't, don't we think that we need to look to graduate attributes with a different point of view? Because the program outcomes specifically for engineering or STEM kind of thing would change. The program articulation matrix would also change. So I would beseech, I would request uh, uh, you as uh, the chairperson of the NBA to kindly uh, amalgamate the philosophies and ideologies uh, together so that, you know, we can we can rewrite uh, possibly graduate attributes yeah, and uh, program uh, outcomes in light of... I have understood you correctly. Uh, Your uh, question uh, is, kind of uh, we at the moment define graduate attributes at the end of the degree. If we are giving various exit points, uh, will we define graduate attributes for the exit points? Am I right? Is this your observation? That instead of defining graduate attributes only at the end of the program, you want us to define graduate attributes at every exit point. Have I understood you correctly? Have I not audible? Because the earlier, uh, the earlier voice was a little, uh, you know, left over. Uh, we could not hear your complete sentence. Kindly repeat it once, once again. So no, what I am trying to say is, if I have understood your question correctly, you feel at the moment we define graduate attributes only at the end of the degree, because there are various exit points, we will have to define graduate attributes at every exit point. Yes, is that right? Yes, sir. But, but I, with, I, those, I agree. with those I definitions, agree. We'll have to do that. program but outcomes would also change. In uh, re emphasize what Professor Sahasrabhuka said, let us first be very, very concerned with the integrated uh, uh, nature of the complete program. See, this uh, multiple entry, multiple exit is a facility given to the students. And as Professor Sahasrabhuka said, I don't expect even 1% students really to take advantage of, uh, uh, somebody may take a gap here, that's possible. That does not change the graduate attributes. Graduate attributes only change when somebody has to, wants to leave and not come back. If he's coming back, then the same graduate attributes will apply. Uh, I would feel, let us be more concerned with the integrated degree and have the proper uh, definitions and then in between we define credits or something because if we start defining graduate attributes for every exit point uh, it may become a little uh, uh, unworkable system this is what appears to me at the moment but maybe we'll have to look into this i i I personally feel graduate attributes for the degree may be defined and when it comes to focus on 99% or the focus on 1%. See, this multiple exit is a facility. We give a facility to somebody who for some reason cannot complete the degree. It's not a normal option which will happen. And as I again repeat, if somebody comes back after a year, then your question does not remain valid. Then the same graduate attributes will apply. So only those who have to leave for some reason or not, uh, family doesn't have means to support or something. I personally again feel it is in nation's interest to bring them back in by giving some assistance or something. But still, if 0.5% have to exit, uh, that cannot be our focus point of designing the entire quality matrix. Uh, we can have some intermediary point, but our focus probably let it be on the overall degree. That's what I feel. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Suranjanda, so, sir, can we take yeah. it? Yeah, can, can we then request uh, Professor Archie Agarwal to make his submission? Professor Agarwal? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Could I, could I request uh, uh, a submission? Uh, Warm welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, how much time I have got? 10 minutes. Uh, can I make a presentation, a small presentation? Uh, in 10 minutes, you please. Yes, you. before 10 minutes, no problem. Okay, thank you. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, 
for this and uh, sorry that I could not come uh, physically uh, to uh, this uh, beautiful place, Mysore. And uh, I'll just make a brief presentation and uh, maybe. Uh, can you just see it? I hope you are uh, able to uh, view it. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Thank, you, sir. thank you, thank you. Yes. So uh, I'm just uh, placing before you uh, the, uh, the the agriculture university domain. Uh, this is just, you can see, we have uh, a domain of uh, 74 uh, agriculture universities, uh, which have now the different uh, subdomains also. Uh, like we have the separate universities for the veterinary universities, horticultural universities, fisheries, and so on and so forth. Uh, but now as per the new education policy, uh, we have to see that how we, we have to make them uh, multidisciplinary and that's what now uh, we are working on and asking to have the collaboration uh, uh, with the, the, the traditional universities. And uh, already we had discussed these issues with the vice chancellors. Uh, we have 95 uh, PG level subjects and UG level subjects, uh, there are about 11 and we, we provide doctorate in about 80 uh, subjects through these aggregate universities. Now I start with a, a brief, uh, uh, brief of my recent visit which I made to one of the university. Uh, you know, uh, there is a Dr. Y.S. Parmar University of Horticulture uh, and Forestry at uh, Solan in Himachal Pradesh. And uh, I called a meeting of the students uh, who are being benefited uh, at the UG level through our incubation programs. Uh, I, I discussed with a young girl and uh, uh, I was really touched by the statement which she gave. Uh, she just told me that, uh, sir, a special training program which we have organized under this World Bank scheme, NAHEP, which we are running, uh, she uh, got to know uh, about how to uh, have this mushroom coming. This job uh, during this COVID period. Uh, is By, uh, by having this mushroom in his uh, uh, garage. So that is the kind of uh, intervention. And when I discussed with the almost 300 students, I, I could not find even a single student who was saying that they want a job. They were all saying they want to become entrepreneur. So that's the kind of uh, outcome of this agriculture education. You can see the devoted uh, students of UG, how to extract the, uh, the, the uh, oil uh, from the different medicinal plants, uh, we re recently I inaugurated uh, this incubation center and uh, they were so uh, excited uh, to work in that uh, particular lab. So this is just a small example. You can see uh, there are a lot of uh, other IT interventions where the students are uh, trying to learn. There are many uh, hydroponic facilities. There are many AI-based uh, technologies, many things, uh, high-tech uh, agriculture, which now we are offering to the students and students are really uh, excited uh, to go for their own uh, own um, entrepreneurs and uh, uh, not to uh, get the jobs, which is, I think, the sense of the uh, new education policy. Uh, and we have, uh, for this, uh, made a lot of studies uh, that what kind of shift is there uh, in, the, uh, in the employment opportunities or in the placements or uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, for the entrepreneurship. And we can see that a lot of scope is there for these startups. And for that, uh, we are making a study that uh, what is the uh, possibility of placing our students and accordingly how much we can increase the gross enrollment ratio. And for gross enrollment ratio, I'll just show another slide where uh, we are uh, seeing that uh, how much we can increase. Uh, already, uh, we are going to reorient our one of the flagship program of uh, UG, that is the Student uh, Ready Program, the Rural Entrepreneurship Awareness Development Yojana, uh, which constitutes uh, four major uh, parts, the uh, attachments to the uh, rural areas, the experiential learning, 
the in-plant training and the student projects and under experiential learning units, which I showed initially some photographs, uh, the students are able to have uh, totally hands-on practice for uh, for six month period. And accordingly, uh, we have revised their course curriculum to include all uh, important aspects, ICT, biotech. We have started some new programs also in uh, many uh, subjects which are uh, now uh, required uh, by the students. Uh, we are also now trying to have, uh, uh, through a resilient agricultural education system, uh, we are uh, going to have an intensive conference also where we'll discuss with about uh, 50 uh, global universities that what are the best practices and how we can again reorient ourselves according to the NEP. Uh, the current uh, career opportunities and what are the future uh, opportunities uh, for the UG and diploma courses. We are going to start, already we have started the lot of diploma courses now as per NEP certificate courses. And we are making provisions for the multiple entry exit and uh, seeing that what kind of uh, placements uh, can be made for different kind of streams of the students. Uh, I'll not take much time. Uh, then we are we have also made a study that what is the um, uh, in the existing faculty teacher faculty uh, ratio uh, or, or the student teacher uh, ratio uh, what is the capacity to increase the uh, intake and we could find that in the existing structure we can have additional seventy four thousand students more students at the UG level uh, so that we can maintain the ratio of one is to ten. Uh, that is uh, bifurcated for the state agricultural universities, central agricultural universities, the ICR deemed universities, and overall we, can, we have seen on different parameters. And uh, around uh, uh, 60 new courses, like the one I just told you, the mushroom raising, the hydroponics, the many other uh, topics we have in, in, uh, incorporated, and the English speaking communication skills. Uh, in the last two years, around 58 uh, courses we have uh, uh, incorporated, which are generating a lot of interest among the students. And they mainly focus towards the entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial skills. Um, but we also uh, give focus uh, uh, of uh, on the personal development, uh, the, the vocational courses, and uh, the, the uh, communication skills, industry-oriented courses, and many, many more things we just give emphasis on. This is some of the UG programs like uh, in one of our most important uh, deemed university, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. We are going to uh, initiate some uh, UG programs, uh, diploma courses, certificate courses uh, from this uh, academic year. Already we have made all arrangements. And uh, we have to also, um, in, uh, we have to also involve our students in training uh, when they are going for six month duration to the villages. So to train the uh, unemployment, um, unemployed youths and to, uh, to tap uh, those uh, young generations in the villages for different skills, uh, maybe for a period of one month, two months, uh, whatever period is required by those. And uh, that's what now we, we want to uh, have through this PARTH scheme. Uh, I'm going to discuss with all the vice chancellors uh, that how we can uh, have this implementation of this scheme. And similarly, how uh, we can have uh, the agriculture education at the, the school level, at the middle level, and at the higher secondary level. So that also now we are finding the pathways, uh, whether they can visit the nearby Krishi Vigyan Kendra, or they can visit the university if it exists there, or they can visit the different ICR institutes. So that all plan now we are going to make for this better uh, awareness. So th that you can see that up to primary level, we can have the uh, EL kind of things, farm widgets. And uh, for uh, a secondary level, we can have these specialized modules. And for the higher secondary level, we can have the vocational skill-based study courses. Uh, for the UG programs, uh, recently the UGC has made a committee. Uh, I'm chairing that committee and we have already formulated a course uh, so that we can uh, introduce in the traditional universities also some courses of the uh, agriculture. Uh, this also shows that how uh, the students are more excited to get admission in the agriculture. Uh, you can see uh, if you compare the data from 2016-17 till date, 
So there's a more increased number of applicants for the same number of seats. And especially uh, for uh, PG and uh, PhD also, you can see that how uh, students are more excited to get admission. Uh, ultimately, I can say that uh, how we are going to uh, implement this uh, NEP, uh, one of the strategies is that uh, how we can have the revised course curriculum so that if somebody wants to exit after one year, they can have the certificate. Uh, and if they want to exit after one year, they should not be deprived of the practical knowledge, which presently we give in the fourth year. So that's what now we are uh, uh, trying to uh, adjust. And uh, for that, already we have developed a roadmap submitted to the Ministry of Education. Uh, that what is our roadmap up to 2035 uh, to implement various provisions of this NEP. And already we have started working on this. We have already made a sixth Dean's Committee report to revise this course curriculum uh, to have various mechanism uh, of uh, taking admission of the students. And for MSc and PhD, again, we have taken many aspects of this NEP, like uh, for the MSc programs, uh, we have started uh, the intensive also now idea. And for MSc programs, we have also started <coughs> by consideration of the uh, research guide, uh, the, the members of the advisory board <coughs> students uh, from the industry side or from uh, any, any other university, wherever they find. So it's not necessary that uh, they have to be only the academic council member. So that's what uh, <coughs> we have started uh, implementing. So this is the details how we have uh, to implement various activities. Uh, already we have asked the universities to increase uh, at least 10% of their seats. And we have asked the universities to uh, exempt this compulsory residence requirement because uh, if you increase the gross enrollment ratio, we don't have the sufficient uh, hostels at present. And uh, we have to also see that how the deemed universities uh, have to be started in, uh, have to be converted into the model research universities. Uh, we have made a detailed program for that. So uh, like that, uh, we have, uh, to have many different points. And for this resilient agricultural education system, we have to focus on three aspects, the digital infrastructure. Already a lot of digital infrastructure we have placed at different institutes. We have a Krasime cloud computing system where we have this LMS, we have artificial intelligence and many, many more things. And we are now also trying to have the complete digitization of our all the course curriculum. Dr. So that can you conclude, please? Yes, I, I can conclude now. Just give me another one minute. Okay. So uh, that's what uh, we are now trying to focus for digital capacity building and uh, other kind of things. Okay. And I can just uh, conclude by saying uh, that uh, the, the challenges uh, and uh, this uh, uh, potential areas of interventions we can categorize into three levels, the pupil, process, and technology. And uh, uh, in all these three, we are working. We are seeing that how we can take help of uh, technology to improve our process and to train more and more people and to attract more and more uh, human resources from the uh, rural areas. So thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Professor Agarwal, for explicating the new initiatives that have been taken under stages of the ICAR in the realm of agriculture education. Professor Victor, do we have time for questions? Sir, I'm afraid because the next session is at two, we don't have time for questions. I don't even see any hands raised, sir. So we Could you then propose a vote of thanks? Yes, sir. We can thank uh, Professor Agarwal. You want to give some closing remarks, sir, Dr. Saranjan Das? No, no, no. You, you, you go ahead with the Vote of thanks, please. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks to the four chairpersons of different committees, Professor K.K. Agarwal, Professor Anil Sahasrabuddha, Professor Bhushan Patwardhan, and Professor R.C. Agarwal for engaging with the vice chancellors. And also thanks to all the vice chancellors for very, very actively participating in this session. I'm sure you must have benefited from this session. And this session will continue in every conference of the AIU. So thank you very much. Thanks to all. Over to Rama. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. So we Excuse have a... me, madam. Yeah. See, you have been given very limited time to raise questions. I think you have more number of questions with you. As suggested by speakers, we have to consolidate our questions and queries. 
and to be sent to the concern officials what i am suggesting we have a session in the afternoon business session between 3 and 4 please be there and you can very well that time it is our time only there's no time restriction and all because as far as i am concerned equal importance should be given to the vice chancellors to place before the grievances of their own and the domain as well so at at all please you are most welcome we will list out all the requirements and grievances and we will see that as suggested by some of the chairman of the speakers we will take it directly to them or we will go we will invite them to au office because they are prepared to come to au office on behalf of you i will submit and our secretary general will prepare this memorandum this is for your kind information sir you need not to feel that you have not been given an opportunity to speak whatever you wanted is it okay sir let us meet again during the business session and list out thank our grievances thank, thank, thank you thanks a lot sir that's a very good suggestion sir thank, thank you, you. Sir. Thank so you. we have come to the end of this interface with the heads of apex body session. Uh, in the meantime, we had uh, the privilege of uh, Professor P. Kali Raj, Vice Chancellor, Bharatiya University, and the Governing Council AIU, uh, Governing Council member AIU to join. I welcome you, sir. And uh, uh, in the beginning of this session, I was given the profiles of the speakers and the chairperson to read out, but. Uh, Uh, they are all stalwarts in the field of higher education, and they need no introduction. We all know them, so I didn't do that. Uh, uh, with this, uh, we have come to the end of this uh, inaugural and uh, foundation day lecture and apex body uh, session. Now, this is the time to actually celebrate uh, the foundation day. Uh, in this year, ninety sixth year, we have the privilege of having. Professor G. Tiruvasagam, a very dynamic and visionary person as president of AIU, and we take this opportunity to felicitate him. And I request uh, Madam uh, Pankaj Mittal to felicitate him uh, with a memento. Can you please? On the daughter's occasion. One more thing. Due to Madam. madam uh So I request Madam to felicitate all our governing council members. Professor Jaswal, Vice Chancellor S R M University, Sony Park. Professor Upendra Dhar, Vice Chancellor Sri Vaishnav Vidya Peeth Indore. Professor Patnaik, I Ikhwai Sikkim. Professor Kali Raj, Bharatiya University. So, Madam. Ah, uh, sir, our lunch is arranged in the Vice Chancellor's bungalow. So, uh, it is third, three hundred meters away from here. Of course. two buses are waiting we have to take the bus and uh, we can reach the vice chancellor bangla have our lunch immediately after lunch you will be vignan bhavan on the campus I immediately after the lunch we all adjourn to the vignan bhavan in the manasagangotri university campus there all sessions will begin thank you very much so next session i want to make an announcement madam kavita sharma uh, is present here next session is in the other venue vigyan bhavan we will take you there apart from madam kavita sharma who will be chairing the next session we have dr amiya bhaume 
Dr. Bhola Thapa and Dr. Aditya Malkani, I request all of you to have your lunch and let us assemble in Vigyan Bhavan. Buses are ready there. And the next session will begin at 2, 2 p.m. after lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, I'm going to cut it like this.